part of the thing which is right yeah. live yeah. about the sacred layer yeah. person you wanted yeah. to say something no, i i agree with paul i would do an aip and a lateral window i think that uh, through the aip really that helps you to re- uh, reduce that put that crescent fracture actually pushing from the inside of the pelvis out to lateralize uh, at the sciatic buttress at the front of the SI joint. And between that and your lateral window, try to get it secure, potentially uh, a, a small plate there to help secure it. But I think your major fixation for that crescent is going to be an LC2 screw starting at the anterior inferior leg spine and going towards the PIIS um, and because your iliosacral screw here wouldn't really capture the unstable uh, portion. Uh, also probably uh, plate fixation or screw fixation up along the ilium there. And then I agree with Paul on the front, two implants, one for the symphysis. Uh, and then I would probably do a Ramus screw as well. Right. Uh, Dr. Rajesh or Dr. Vikas, any further comments while we go ahead? go ahead? Okay, so this is what we were seeing. And I would like to say that when I said we thought it was a sort of a combined injury with a more component of a crescent fracture, which was seen out here. If you look at the back with the sacroiliac joint on the posterior side, being normal and it's a subset of LC2 sort of an injury with the open diastasis so makes it combined injury but most of the things when we see this pattern in an axial CT scan what we find is that the sacroiliac joint is shifted posteriorly and it is a subluxation which is happening posterior but and this is the day classification dividing it into one two and three saying uh, depending upon the size of the posterior fragment and how and where you can put in a screw or iliosacral screw or put in a plate or the anterior side, depending on whether it is a type 1 fracture where you would put in a plate or maybe type 2 or 3 as shown by Chip Route that you can put in easily some screws. But for me, this was, and that's what we said, that this sort of a fracture and as rightly pointed out that here the sacroiliac joint was opened up and was having a partial fracture dislocation. So we said it is a component of a having major compression injury in which the ileum has shifted and instead of going posteriorly subluxed, it is subluxing and going anterior. The points to note was that it was an anteriorly displaced fracture dislocation of sacroiliac joint. And as was discussed, L5 nerve root might be damaged. It is just lying next and adjacent to it. And that was the critical thing. If you look at the CT angio also, you can see that the common iliac and the bifurcation of it is also just adjacent to where this fragment is going to go. So it's a pretty uncommon injury. I looked at the literature. I could find only two cases at that time. This was around eight to 10 years back that I fixed this. And there was only that too in 1970s, late, where they had a polytrauma cases. And they had a pretty bad outcome out of these cases because they couldn't make sure how to go about fixing these. So we went about anterior approach or so or posterior approach. So that was our question. Mostly in crescent fracture, when we go, we can fix that posteriorly as well, because then the rotational element as well as the displacements can be easily found. And you can correct them properly, both from the LC2 screw part or as well as putting in a plate out the outer side. But here we thought that it will be better to see the nerve as well as the vessels if we can have any problems. And we went about fixing that from the interior side, putting in a Stinman pin at the inferior spine or the iliac crest and just lifting it up, making sure it is not rubbing the sacral ala. Because if it rubs the sacral ala while reduction, it is going to cause. What is crucial is that the sacroiliac, jo- uh, the ligaments out there, the, the uh, sacrotubrous or sacrospinous may not be broken that much. And if they are not broken, if it is old fracture to reduce, that is going to be very difficult for us. And that's how we were able to preserve and visualize the L5 nerve root and make sure that it was protected. And as was said, we fixed it with two plates. Here, we went about with the lateral window. This is around eight to 10 years back, as I said, with the fan and steel. And this is the incisions which we took. We had a plan that we will, after reduction, we'll put in the screws out there with an additional plate, which is going to fix the posterior fragment along with the interior fragment. And then we'll put in a normal SI joint plate, which is there, which will be fixing both the fragments with the sacrum, which is intact out here, and the ileum to it. And in the front, we will be doing the same reduction with the symphysial fixation, as well as here we put in a screw out there. So this is the fixation which we got at that time. This is his follow-up. 
after one year where the things had united and he had good motions this was not a young and over the years we have had opportunity to treat around 10 9 to 10 cases now of such fracture you can see here also if you find out this inlet view the entire sacroiliac joint which has partially fractured and is dislocated anteriorly lying in front of the ala if you see the ct scan of the 2d scan as well you will see that it is having a undisplaced sacroiliac on the opposite side crescent the standard normal crescent on one side and this sort of a crescent on the other side which is a type 1 type 2 sort of a fracture and here it is the normal crescent we went about the same way the iliosic the lc2 screws were put percutaneously afterwards while putting in a prone position while these were put anteriorly we always went to go anteriorly look at the thing look at the nerve root ensure that we are not pressing it and make sure there is no vascular injury which can happen out here you another sure, case i like i like the fact that uh, that you're doing these you know primarily these complex ones from the front you know because while while people think the crescent fractures are always intact at the sacroiliac joint they're not yeah. and you know with this with this pattern in particular you can have si joint instability even after you fix the ilium and have instability through that and the way you're doing these you're able to look at the si joint and put a little plate across so i really like that technique that's an important point and this is another right. bilateral crescent one the classical crescent which we see on the right on the left hand side and the new variant which we found with the anterior sacroiliac dislocation lying on the other so we had a two cases like this where you can have a bilateral crescent having this fracture pattern again when both from the lateral window just lateral window from both the sides and it gives you good reduction for both the fractures we had some anterior injury and the abrasion so we didn't fix it anteriorly and another case which is again showing the same thing ala lying the ilium lying in front this is a variant i would say of a crescent fracture which is not going posteriorly the vector component is going from posterior to anterior and maybe the ilium is just going and just cannot recoil back once the fracture has happened from the si joint crescent sort of a fracture and exactly the same thing which we did for this part and the crescent was fixed like this we published this in our one of the case series in our indian journal of orthopedics also and in the end i would say that yes normally we see the crescents which is a posterior relatively stable injury which can be treated from the back side or the front but what we have found over the years in the last 10 to 12 years that there can be some anterior and this is slightly different injury from what we normally see we have to be beware of taking care and proper protection of the nerve root which is very essential and do it as fast as possible especially our indian friends because i had a case which was 3 to 4 weeks old and it was so difficult to reduce it because the ligaments have contracted by that time and you cannot fiddle around there with your common iliac bifurcating along with the l5 nerve root there so you can have a horrible time reducing them in a slightly delayed case thank you thanks a lot uh, vivek that was a very interesting series uh, great job Uh, I'll now invite Paul to present a case of failed sacral fixation. Okay, so I, I always think uh, I learn more from things that didn't go well. <clears throat> so this this case is you'll you'll note is a fairly old case. Um, so it's a 43 year old, hemodynamically unstable with a, a pretty significant head injury that that ended up with just a bolt and high ICPs. Uh, didn't need any kind of a craniectomy. um and uh was intubated in the unit was cleared by the trauma service you know this is the kind of stuff they always tell so you can do a short procedure <clears throat> they were pretty unstable you can see here a you know a very unstable sacral fracture with cranial displacement bilateral complex frame i ones that you would you know you'd want to fix the front and then either use a frame or do something in the I mean, fix the back and then do a frame or something in the front, or you know, if you wanted to use Ramus screws or plates, whatever, whatever your choice was. But you can see the comminuted injury of the left sacrum here. <clears throat> It's a pretty significant amount of displacement. So we treat these early with traction. So they went immediately into traction. Was in the ICU in traction, and uh, at that point, I said, "Oh, what are the options?" So you could do two open approaches. You could ORAF. 
Uh, the front, then the back, you could do the back, then the front, you could do percutaneous fixation of the sacrum if you can get good alignment and then do something to the ring or put a frame on the ring or just do fixation in the back alone. <clears throat> this is just the CT sort of showing, you know, nothing surprising, I think, for anybody, unilateral injury in the back and uh, bilateral injury in the front. To me, that, that CT didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. <clears throat> so again, we go to these uh, options. Uh, so what I did was we brought the patient to the operating room. I use this pal parallelogram type of attraction where I put a chest roll against the uh, affected side with a bolster. It's actually a hip positioner and then uh, put the other leg in extension and you pull traction through this side. And you can actually titrate the reduction pretty well. <clears throat> I think this case was probably 11 or 12 years ago. Um, so you can see I put SI screws in, two, SI, two S1 screws. I would probably use an S1 and S2 now. And my fixation construct, I think, would be a little bit different now. And this was sort of one of the cases that led me to change a little bit of what I did. At the point we were putting the second screw in, the patient actually almost coded. Uh, so we got the second screw down and the patient got brought back to the ICU in traction. <clears throat> Again, intubated and theoretically paralyzed. So, you know, we plan to let the patient settle down in traction to protect the, uh, to protect the fixation, to protect the anterior ring uh, and our posterior fixation, and then come back as soon as the patient was stable. And they were uh, intubated, sedated for their head injury and, you know, head of the bed elevated the whole deal. <clears throat> so I went away for three days to, uh, to a meeting and I came back and said, all right, well, let's just get a portable and, and you know, be able to plan because probably in a couple of days we'll be able to bring the patient back. And, uh, you know, this side looked the same, uh, but this, this side didn't look quite the way it used to. <clears throat> so obviously this was a fairly dramatic uh, early failure. So this is a patient, again, who's in the unit, in traction, theoretically sedated, so they're not moving because of their head injury that, that obviously was bucking and moving around. But you can see the kind of early failure you get when you don't have enough stability in the ring. Um, so then my first reaction was this, and then, uh, and then I had to think about what am I going to do now? <clears throat> so, you know, at that time, very few people were doing transsacral screws. Like I put long screws in to get to the other side, but there was a real concern around, around impinging the other side. And we used to do it only really for tumor cases. Um, so I got a CAT scan of this. This is what it looked like. You can see the deformity is back to where it was. The screws are in the lateral segment. <clears throat> But the CAT scan showed that the track that we had fortuitously, because we went to the other ilium, I mean, the other side of the, the, uh, the sacral ala, probably would suffice to go all the way across and grab the other side. Um, and you can sort of see that on these cuts. And then here you can see the same thing on the, on the sagittals where those screws are <clears throat> going through in a, in a relatively safe area to maybe go all the way across. Uh, so the patient was was still intubated. Their blood pressure was still highly labile. Um, what what would you guys do at this point? Mm -hmm. <coughs> at my, at yeah. my, at my, in my hands, what we will be doing is yes, if possible, the trans sacral screws right now in now present day world, <coughs> but not before five or six years before. But what we normally do is we put in a trans iliac plate. Uh, by having it in a prone position, and that's a very, I normally reduce these fractures in a prone position, see the fracture which has been reduced properly, then take out a <coughs> small ticket of PSIS as a window, slide in my plate down as Landolfer from Austria, <coughs> they have described that in JOT. And so that's how we put in a transiliac plate, which holds that. And it's a, you can say a cheap version of a transsacral yeah. screw. But yes, it just helps a lot for the patient. Right. And, and you would do, would you do at this point because it's, you know, she's now probably by the time I got back, I think seven or 10 days out, would you do an open reduction or would you try to do a, a close reduction at that time frame? Uh, it depends upon her <coughs> physical habitus, how exactly she is. But normally, if it is she was actually not, more than she was not not uh, in, in contradistinction to most of the stuff we have, she was actually not morally obese. She probably had a BMI of 32 or something. So she wasn't huge. Okay. So I would still try to get it a reduction, but in my hands, mostly if it is more than 1.5 centimeters displaced in the right in the beginning, I go prone, reduce them in my vision, and then put in the transsacral screws or a transiliac plating at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that was certainly one of the options I had. Uh, anybody else, Hassan? What would you What would you do? Would you? No, I, would, I would. I would. I would repeat the procedure supine again. Get <coughs> again with with bed assisted traction, and then I would add uh, transit leg transacral fully threaded screws just to really lock it up. Um, and then potentially look at the look at the S2 segment to see if I could add even another screw just to really lock it up. And then definitely add anterior <coughs> ring to help bolster the posterior ring. Yeah, and that that pretty much is this, that's that's great. That's perfectly sort of the spectrum of what I was thinking, right? So my plan was, I, I didn't think there was going to be a lot more room in S1 to find a new corridor, but because those corridors looked pretty good, um, just by happenstance, you know, by putting the screws far across. My plan was to bring it to the operating room, put it supine, just like Hassan said, re-reduce it in the same way that I did before, and then, you know, just take the take the, a guide wire, put it through my screw, which was really not very hard to find because it was sitting out this far, and and see if that track was still intact. Like, I did I get the reduction close enough that that, that corridor and that screw track would still be good? And if it was, then I was going to go for – you know, a, a, I use partially threaded screws because I wanted to maximally compress this, but go all the way to the other side. Um, and then, you know, my thought was if I if I either couldn't reduce it well or the track really was was pretty poor, I take the screws out, flip it prone and do an open reduction, as, as Dr. Trick has said. So I sort of both things in my head um, <clears throat> and I was hoping for the best and expecting the worst. I, I usually get the worst, but uh that's what we were sort of hoping for. So here you can see the reduction again and as it comes into the traction. So <clears throat> this was my sort of attempt. Um, and if that failed, then I was going to go with uh, posterior plate and screws <clears throat> and not any anterior fixation if I did that. So we were lucky. And when we, when we pulled it back down, we were able to get those tracks again. So these are the original screws uh, that were in initially on the bottom one. And the top one is sort of a, a new screw. Uh, so you can see we went all the way across through that same tract. Uh, and, and again, I used partially threaded screws and I, I lagged the crap out of it. So I compressed it and it got really, really good bite. Uh, and then I, I didn't fix the front because I, did, I, I wasn't too worried about the rotational instability. <clears throat> this is what we ended with. I think today I would, I would probably fix the front just to give myself some additional support. Uh, but when we put these screws in, we sort of evaluated it. When we took the traction off, I did flex extents views uh, and, and nothing really shifted very much. And I would agree with Hassan that, you know, this was, this was really before transacral screws were being used very much. And, and at this point, even my standard for this would be an S1 and an S2 transacral screw. So I, I definitely would have at the current time taken that S2 opportunity. But at, at this time, this was sort of our revision. And this went on to unite, unite pretty well. Uh, the head injury actually resolved, and she became uh, she became very high functioning again. But it was a it's my only uh, it's my only SI my only sacral failure. It's pretty early, and I think you know we we you can learn a lot from this, right? I think had we been able to get a frame on in the OR even and traction, I, I don't know that this failure would have occurred. And you know, in the current day, I think we would all go with these common root injuries with transacral fixation and then trying to get good compression. Uh, of those fractures. That was, uh, again, a great case, uh, Paul. I think a uh, lot to learn. And uh, I, 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 I was just wondering uh, uh, if the patient hadn't deteriorated the first time uh, uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> would have gone all the way, uh, would there have been chances of, uh, I mean, was it your initial plan to fix anteriorly or you would have been happy just with the posterior fixation? Yeah, no, I was, I was with the shorter screws, I was planning to put a frame on, um, you know, so I, I would typically evaluate it in flexion extension a little bit just to understand what kind of instability is present after the back. And, you know, if you look at Joel Matta's paper, you know, anterior fixation, when you had accurate alignment in the back and compressed was, was unnecessary in most cases. <clears throat> so I, I didn't really get a good understanding of how much instability there was here uh, because we, we had to rush out of the operating room. So I, I, the plan was to evaluate that and decide. And we didn't really have that opportunity. And since I was keeping the patient in traction, I was happy with my posterior reduction because I thought it looked very good. My hope was that, you know, we would get back to the operating room to sort of make that decision at a later date. Um, and unfortunately, that, that got waylaid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a few minutes for discussion. I, I, we still don't have any questions. So I've got a couple of minutes. 
So I am coming back to Vivek for your uh, yeah. for your case that you showed. Hassan suggested, and I understand that you did this case long time back, but Hassan suggested that uh, anterior intrapelvic approach with lateral window uh, could have taken care of that. So I, my question is: today, if you get the same injury, would it uh, would you do it the same way you did it earlier, or would you now like to go for? Uh, Something like we, what he suggested, anterior intrapelvic with the lateral window. What would be your choice now, frankly? No, still I would be going along with the lateral window one. Why? Because this this sacrum was lying in front of the ala, and it was going right up to the mid raphe of the sacrum. So, if I have to reduce, I am not that. He has learned it from Saji, and he has been doing it himself with so much expertise. i am not so confident of going right in front of the sacral center point and able to reduce my reduction if it is not happening that way yes after my reduction has been taken care from the lateral side then when i am opening from the anterior symphysis then the routine exposure from the intrapelvic can give me a push back which will be able to push back that reduced fragment to a minimal 1 or 2 mm of the exact sacroiliac joint reduction but the initial reduction i would still prefer to be going it from the lateral side opening up with maybe an asi osteot osteotomy to be looking so that i can go just inside if anything is going to happen because from intrapelvic i am not i won't be sure that i will be able to get that exposure at the mid sacral level maybe hasan you can say Yeah no no I agree I would work through both windows yeah. it's just that I think that the force you can generate from the exactly. intrapelvic window to push that fragment laterally yeah. Yeah. is is more force directly pushing on it with a ball spike pusher but uh certainly starting at the lateral window to make sure that the L5 nerve root is not entrapped when you're pushing from the yeah. intrapelvic window yes exactly the finer minor adjustments will be much better done from the intrapelvic side and those adjustments can be done from there but initial is more still from the lateral side that's what i feel paul uh, coming back to uh, your plan um, i uh, remember a very uh, uh, famous quotation it said anybody can perform the operation but a real surgeon is the one who knows how to get out of problem so i think the the condition which you saw when you come back and see everything has fallen apart i think that is the time when it is a great lesson here and i think it was uh, it was a great idea to uh, you know pass the k wire to the canalytic screw uh, you know find the same track and uh, and then go on and uh, extend your fixation to the opposite side i think that's the great lesson here i would like the audience to pay attention to i think it the two or three things i always say uh don't lose your cool think about it i mean the plan which um, everybody which actually vivek also said there was nothing wrong with the plan uh but then you know um when you are in a complication i think you should find the easiest way to do it and probably uh the way you try to track the same uh, uh the same holes and extend is a lesson far beyond this particular case i think you should be very careful in choosing how you are going to fix the problem which has occurred and i always say don't hesitate to ask for somebody else's opinion once things have gone it's, of course doesn't have, apply to you paul i'm sure uh, i'm not talking about you but it no, you you can talk about me i i couldn't honestly i couldn't agree with that more i mean i i think I think the more you know the less you know, right? I mean, I I I can tell you my first year in practice at a fellowship, my confidence level was far higher than it is today. <laughs> There's no All question in my mind right. that, you know, that the 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 more you experience and the more that you do, I think the even the more of a perfectionist you are and and when you think about what you're doing, you know, the more you know, the harder it becomes because you just, you know, your your acceptance of any fine even fine amount of displacement or anything that doesn't look right is is become so so low and you recognize so much more you know 20 years in practice you recognize more than you do your first year in practice i mean if you don't there's a real problem with your learning curve so 
I, I, I ask people's opinions all the time. I have no problem with that. I had a case the other day, I was doing a humeral non-union and, and the radial nerve just looked too small to me. And my hand surgeon was, a, was across the hall. I said, just, just come in and look at this radial nerve and make sure you think it's actually the radial nerve. Like I just want to make sure everybody agrees. Like what, what's the downside, right? It's all about the patient. Like the, the day that your, that your pride is greater than your empathy, like you need to get out of this job. <laughs> sure. And you exactly echo the sentiments which uh, the great arthroplasty surgeon Larry Dot in his uh, book in the first chapter on total hip replacement. So I think we all need to learn as much as we need to learn about the techniques. Great gentlemen, I think it's time to move on to the next session, which is the uh, acetabular fracture. So I invite uh, Dr. Hassan Mir to give his talk on the acetabular fixation to anterior uh, intrapelvic approach. All right, so uh, we'll get started on this. So this is going to be a short talk followed by a video showing how uh, how I do the anterior anterior pelvic approach. Um, and again, my disclosure. So the ilioinguinal approach is what I was initially trained on and what probably the vast majority of, of pelvic and acetabular surgeons uh, initially learned. Some of our trainees now uh, have not actually done this approach and are only learning the, the AIP and, and modifications. But this was initially described in 1965 by uh, Letronel, and it's for patterns with uh, anterior displacement. So all the patterns you see there. And, um, you know, the middle window, which is very valuable, uh, for reduction and implant placement. Uh, it does, however, require dissection of the inguinal, inguinal canal and femoral nerve vascular bundle and then, a, and then a, a, a proper repair following that. And so that's what makes people a little nervous about that, that uh, this classic approach who haven't uh, done it. The other thing is that this approach really has been modified over time by several surgeons for the, the, uh, the, the uh, medial window, uh, not you know, actually being more of an AIP approach. So there's a lot of surgeons who say they do a classic ilioinguinal approach, but actually it's modified because their their uh, medial exposure is through an AIP. So the AIP is uh, uh, is an intrapelvic approach that was initially des described by Stapa and Reeves for repair of inguinal hernias uh, using Dacron mesh. And it was uh, then further described in the 90s, 1990s, by uh, uh, Dr. Herbin Salo et al. And, and then Dr. Uh, Dean Cole and Brett Ballhoffner here in Florida. In, uh, in, and so this was uh, utilized for a fixation of, uh, of acetabular fractures. And the advantage of this, an intrapelvic approach that's extra peritoneal. So you're not having to get anywhere near the intestines, but you can uh, you can deal with acetabular fractures, you know, through an approach that was sim familiar to a lot of pelvic surgeons already working on pubic symphysis injuries. So this has been well described in the literature now. This is just a sampling showing that you can get really good anatomic reductions through this approach. The, uh, the, the folks who were resistant to change and were very uh, much in favor of sticking to the classic ilioinguinal said, well, without the middle window, you can't get things reduced. You can't get things fixed properly. I think that's been well established that that's not the case now. So this was an early study that we did uh, looking at what can you actually see uh, and instrument through the, the st modified STAPA approach through the anterior interpelvic approach, same thing. And uh, so this was a cadaveric study where we did this on 10 cadavers and then used a drill to mark where we could actually see. So we didn't drill beyond where we could see. We did what we could actually see in these cadavers. And on average, it's about two centimeters above the pelvic rim, five centimeters below the pelvic brim. And you can get all the way from the symphysis back to about an anterior, uh, a centimeter onto the sacrum. So it gives you a pretty wide exposure if you know how to mobilize and move your retractors. So this isn't just with one single retractor placement. That's very important to note with this exposure, just like the ileoinguinal, you have to be uh, facile with moving your retractors, using your assistance properly to get, to get a good view of, of really what you need to see. Now, when you add the la a regular lateral window, um, and I have this in yellow because it's really hard to see everything, but, uh, but you can certainly get to everything as far as palpation and instrumentation through a lateral window. And then, you know, uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Dr. Trika, uh, 
if you add an ASIS osteotomy, now all of a sudden you can see instrument clamp and do really everything that you could from a, uh, a classic middle window and iliolingual approach. And uh, this ASIS osteotomy, again, the advantage of it is that you're you're leaving the inguinal ligament and uh, and canal completely intact. And then if you can if you can't fix an ASIS osteotomy, you probably shouldn't be fixing the thing that requires the ASIS osteotomy, if that makes sense, <laughs> right? So, so it, this has been described uh, in the literature as well. Usually it's, uh, it's a, a step cut osteotomy between the ASIS and anterior inferior iliac spine. You do uh, ele elevate uh, uh, on the lateral side of the ilium to, to get a good view. The one difference thing is that when you're doing your lateral window, if you think you might need an osteotomy, make sure to stop your external oblique elevation. Don't take it all the way off as you normally would from a lateral window to try to improve your visualization because then you lose the muscular attachments on the osteotomy, which probably at the end of the day, you could sew it back down and, and it will do all right. But if you can off the bat, think that you might need the osteotomy and leave those muscular attachments intact, it's easier to reduce and fix at the end and probably more stable at the end. So this just shows how much more visualization you can get. You can see this is without the osteotomy. You can't really see that well, and, and it's hard to get your lighting in and everything. But when you add the osteotomy, the entire uh, hemipelvis just opens up. You can get to midline on the sacrum with the osteotomy. And then working uh, anteriorly, you can get all the way down to the pubic root quite easily and work on uh, the, an, any anterior wall and pubic root components of your injury. And this essentially gives you uh, clamp trajectories and implant trajectories similar to what you would get from a middle window of an ilioinguinal. So now the AIP. This is a video demonstration of a modified stopo approach for intrapelvic exposure. The patient is supine with a bump under the ipsilateral thigh to relax the iliacus and psoas muscles. The incision is a standard 12 centimeter fan and steel incision, approximately two centimeters proximal to the symphysis. The lateral window can be added in cases that necessitate that exposure. After incising the skin, the subcutaneous tissues are elevated. This dissection is performed in live surgery with wood-handled elevators and electric cautery to maintain hemostasis. Subcutaneous flaps are developed proximally and distally to aid in exposure and mobility of the surgical window. It's most important to develop this approach in the cephalad and caudal directions as these will aid in deep visualization. Lateral dissection places the spermatic cord at risk. The fascial midline can be further identified by the crossing fi fascial fibers of the external obliques. It's important to gain vertical length to allow for a long split to aid in intrapelvic visualization. Blunt dissection is carried out between the left and right rectus abdominis muscle bellies and into the space of retias to avoid injury to the bladder. A deaver is used to retract the rectus. Uh, a moist slab as well as a malleable retractor is placed to protect the bladder with care to avoid injury to the neck of the bladder. Subperiosteal dissection is then performed along the superior ramus. Once past the pubic tubercle, a sharp Hohmann retractor can be placed over the ramus, which will greatly aid in intrapelvic visualization. <clears throat> the line on the model uh, upcoming shows the area for the next part of the dissection. We proceed cautiously after this point to avoid cutting or tearing of corona mortis vessels as they may be under tension, especially with medially displaced fractures. A shans pin may be placed percutaneously into the proximal femur for an assistant to provide lateral traction. The deaver and malleable retractors are repositioned to mobilize the window as we move laterally. The operator nerve vascular bundle is identified as it courses anteriorly to exit the superlateral portion of the foramen. Corona mortis connections are identified, which are ligated with vascular clips prior to further lateral dissection. The malleable retractor can now be repositioned to protect the obturator bundle as we dissect posterior laterally along the pelvic rim and quadrilateral surface. The obturator internus muscle belly is elevated to expose. So the audio fades there, but it's just talking about exposing the quadrilateral surface now back to the, uh, to the greater sciatic notch. 
This can also be carried posteriorly towards the greater sciatic notch with care to avoid damage to the superior glute gluteal bundle. The iliopectineal fascia is carefully released to allow access to the false pelvis above the brim. The external iliac vessels must be carefully protected with a deeper elevator. We now have exposure of approximately two centimeters above the pelvic brim and five centimeters below the pelvic brim. A sharp home and over the anterior acetabular wall and a malleable retractor posteriorly may help in widening the exposure. In our cadaver study, we performed the STAPA approach on 10 specimens and then used a drill to mark the boundaries of exposure. We then stripped off all of the tissues and calculated the viewable surface areas and boundaries in relation to the bony landmarks. Please see the article for details of our findings. All right. So just a, a few quick case examples to show what can be done through the AIP and lateral window. So this is a gentleman, uh, 65, who fell from a ladder and has this uh, anterior column posterior hemitransverse fracture with uh, with dome uh, with a dome impacted segment. Um, here you can see on on uh, the uh, ghost reconstructions from uh, from the CT scan again the fracture pattern there, and then here you can see the the impacted dome segment uh, is visualized. So working through the lateral window in the AIP, you can see a small uh, buttress plate through the lateral window to help reduce uh, the uh, posterior extent of the, of the fracture uh, of the anterior column. And then working through the AIP, we can directly visualize and, uh, and manipulate the, uh, the dome impacted segment. Uh, and then we're able to close the anterior column uh, anteriorly with a, another small buttress plate and then uh, added our uh, posterior column uh, clamping through the AIP interval, and uh, then this was our final construct, which, you know, this is short plates here, but you can easily place long plates uh, uh, in a, above the brim as well, working through both windows. And so this is the final CT scan and shows that we were able to get the dome impacted segment back to a good uh, alignment. The columns look good and, and the rest of it's well aligned working through these uh, uh, less invasive, although still dangerous approaches. And this was uh, this patient healed. Another example of a T-type fracture in a, a young 17-year-old uh, female with a marked displacement uh, uh, medially. And uh, here she was after being placed in the skeletal traction, a large hematoma you can see shifting her bladder uh, across the midline. And then this is work all done through an anterior intrapelvic approach. This was uh, uh, reducing the posterior column fracture and then working through the AIP. When you actually look at the image on the left-hand side of the screen, the iliac oblique, that looks like a, a plate that we would put on the posterior column on the retroacetabular surface, but this was actually placed uh, intrapelvic. Uh, and you can see that on the uh, obturator oblique that is on the other side of the pelvis from where you would normally see it. And then um, we went on to be able to address the, uh, the low anterior column uh, portion of the fracture and got it reduced and buttressed. And then uh, here's her post-operative CT scan showing good alignment. She also had an ileostacral joint injury on the same side. And then here she he is uh, healed at a year. So uh, thanks for that and uh, happy to uh, take any questions afterwards. That was a great talk and uh, now, um I'll be speaking about the uh, arthroplasty in acetabular fractures. And uh, so uh, the learning objectives here is, uh, are uh, what's the role of total hip arthroplasty in acetabular fractures? We are going to discuss the delayed versus the acute total hip arthroplasty, the 10 commandments for performing THA in acetabular fractures, why acute THA in elderly, and the choice of implants and whether we need the special implants. So uh, this is 1993, and the role of total hip arthroplasty in acetabular fracture was primarily if you had post-traumatic arthritis or you had malunion or non-union of the uh, conservatively treated fracture, or if there was, um, you know, uh, immediate hip arthroplasty needed in certain displaced fractures with a poor prognosis. Now, uh, from there, by 2013, we had extended the indications, even though with the same goals. So, uh, it, this paper talked about uh, doing arthroplasty for proven poor outcome with open reduction tunnel fixation or conservative treatment. That means if the patient had radiological features of osteoarthritis, AVN, fixation failure, or impairment of function, which would lead to a delayed THA, 
or predictable poor outcome with the open reduction tunnel fixation. That means severe combination, not amenable to reconstruction, dome impaction, femoral head impaction, and in the elderly, where you would undertake acute THA with or without fixation. Let's talk about the 10 commandments for delayed totally parthoplasty inestabular fracture. The first, of course, in any operated case which fails in orthopedics, the first rule is to rule out infection. So always exclude latent infection, do an ESR, CRP, aspirate, and if you are in doubt, do a two-stage. Like this case, uh, who was fixed, ESR was 58, CRP was 117. Um, it was operated elsewhere. The first stage involved removal of all the implants. Uh, and uh, uh, and it actually, we routinely sonic sonicate these implants at our center. So we, uh, we have an opportunity to get the type of bug which was uh, infecting. The second is the abductor status, uh, because that's so paramount for uh, a good functioning, stable hip arthroplasty. So look at the greater trochanter contour on the X-ray, feel the muscle, test the strength. You can also do the Trendelenburg test. Uh, so this was a case who had a, a fracture of the acetabulum with the proximal femoral fracture, which was infected, debrided, and implants were removed. And uh, when it went for the second stage, we could find the bare greater trochanter devoid of any soft tissue attachments whatsoever. The third rule is the distal pulsations and the nerve function must be ascertained. Palpate the vessels, uh, all the peripheral vessels, do a CT angiography if required or MR neurogram for documentation in the case. So you can see in this particular case, see the proximity of the, uh, of the vessels to the implant. And this is uh, a case where an MR neurogram was yeah, done. And uh, for those um, uh, who can understand uh, uh, he, uh, our uh, uh, Hindi, I think there's a, uh, a mention of the a short commentary on when the uh, radiologist is showing the uh, the uh, sciatic nerve here. And uh, as uh, the uh, scans pass, you can see actually it is quite close to the, uh, to the hardware. So it is possible to actually exactly map the sciatic nerve and see whether... Uh, it's close to the hardware uh, and particularly if you find a pulsey after any kind of surgery, we routinely perform the MR neurogram. The fourth is look at the amount of shortening and the range of motion at the hip, knee and ankle. So often these cases, if they are associated with proximal femoral fracture or otherwise can have upright and greater trochanter, shortening of the limb, other injuries in the ipsilateral limb, knee and ankle movement. The fifth rule is to quantify and plan for managing the bone defect. So you, you will need to assess the need for grafts and augments, presence or absence of pelvic discontinuity, which may surprise you. Uh, you know, you may not be expecting it. The need for augments and buttresses when the head is not available. So um, uh, this is an example which had a pelvic discontinuity and it needed uh, the special technique I'm going to talk more about. And if you don't have a femoral head, you will need to put these uh, uh, buttresses uh, to uh, take care of the bone loss. So you have to be prepared all the time. Look at the previous scars and the approach. Follow the previous scars. So most often the posterior approach uh, um, uh, is the one which is used quite commonly. Then expect the scarring, the blood loss. And of course, uh, you have to keep in mind the injury to the neurovascular uh, bundle because of the resurgery and the scarring. The next one is the choice of the acetabular shell. So now we have a lot of uh, modern porous coated cell, shells available. Uh, we prefer the multi-hole uh, shells with provision for additional screw fixation. But then it's ideal if you could have the provision for additional hole creation and then new, dual mobility cuff is a new attraction. So uh, whenever we uh, operate on these uh, complex uh, uh, deficient uh, acetabuli, we always want to put in the kickstand screws down there because if uh, it's uh, not uncommon to find a lot of bone here so the ten temptation is to put a whole lot of screws there and the cup can just tilt out unless you put uh, these screws in the pubis and ischium here and think about the hardware in situ so identify the implants which need removing the implants have all, all may have often been in place for a way for several years and uh, removal may be difficult and then that can weaken the bone post operatively so we say don't fight hard with hardware only remove those implants which are coming in your way. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, it eases the surgery, minimizes complications, reduces the 
duration and the blood loss and does not compromise the bone strength but you may need these special techniques and the metal cutting birds for the uh, a 30 year old male had the orif 2 years back developed avascular necrosis you can see these two screws which could actually be seen inside the acetabulum and uh, 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 you know if you are prepared with the hardware removal set and uh, retain the hardware which does not come your way you can see those two screws have been removed but everything else has been left because there's no point in unnecessarily complicating the surgery and increasing the duration of surgery with more loss and as well as the risk of uh, neurovascular injury another, uh, so this is uh, the follow up x-ray another example you see these these two screws 41 year old female 9 uh, years back the fixation was done and uh, you can see this one screw needed removal but then the, we let the everything else be where it is a uh, 51 year old male 2 years back or have developed secondary osteoarthritis and you can see uh, the the inferior part the inferior screws had to be removed and uh, that's the follow up x ray um 59 year old female again uh, done 2 years back and then you can see that uh, the uh, this the hardware only that hardware which is coming the way is removed and and notice these screws in the pubis and ischium which have to be uh, put in Uh, another example here and uh, uh, you can see the trochanteric screws had to be removed here because they were a cause of uh, recurrent bursitis so they were uh, done away with and the surgery was done and this is the follow up uh, uh, fracture dislocation right hip in a 37 year old male and uh, orif was done elsewhere and uh, developed secondary osteoarthritis infection with the loss of femoral head so uh, uh, 10 months after the indic surgery the debridement and uh, hardware removal had to be done and the total hip could be done uh, after the uh, markers were negative uh, and uh, another case uh, proven negative i mean suggestive of um, uh, uh, the infection control by the markers and uh, you could it's even Uh, the acetabulum is so supportive that you can actually put it without any screws through the dome and uh, this the follow up uh, this is a 63 year old male who had orif 4 years back and uh, this is uh, the surgery done and this is the 4 year follow up uh, this was a very interesting case 47 year old male diabetic hypertensive uh, and cardiomyopathy uh, he had an orif done somewhere else developed secondary osteoarthritis underwent uh, total hip with the primary surgeon and um, surely enough it got infected and implant was loosened he had a permanent pacemaker put in which was infected so there was a focus of infection and it was very difficult to take out so debris mine implant removal was done after the uh, pacemaker uh, was taken out because that was the focus of infection uh, infection control and this was the uh, definite reconstruction and uh, this was the uh, follow up x ray a uh, um, uh, 37 year old male had a fracture dislocation of right hip with a foot drop and uh, you know the remnant head could be used in this case for uh, reconstruction and this is the follow up uh, uh, a 40 year old male uh, road traffic accident at 22 years of age underwent uh, orif developed secondary osteoarthritis underwent uh, resurfacing after 3 years and this lasted him good 15 years when he presented with pain and heaviness and a big pseudo tumor and uh, this was a revision surgery because he was very young he was revised with a short stem and continues to do very well uh, and uh, this was a hvs antigen positive patient neglected fracture dislocation uh, previously not operated but needed a major reconstruction with the femoral head and you can see the screws to enhance the stability here uh, uh, for these cases uh, and this is the follow up um another interesting case this was an army official who had a railway track injury fracture dislocation of the right hip bilateral below knee amputee who developed uh, avascular necrosis of the femoral head and uh, this was reconstructed and uh, another example where the fracture dislocation of the left hip attend, attempted or it failed and developed infection de- debris mark kevil removal and then it was done with the uh, uh, with the you would see the some of these are done with the modular stem to take care of the uh, of the uh, issues with the limb length and uh, and the uh, stability now just going to talk about the acute total hip arthroplasty in acetabular fracture uh, like i said if you anticipate poor prognosis with fixation 
um, the two most important bony landmarks for acetabular component uh, fixation in these cases are the uh, the uh, subchondral bone attached to the uh, AIIS and the subchondral bone attached to the ischium. If you can wedge your cup between these two, you are good. So everything else is a secondary fixation. And uh, this is the one which gives you primary fixation. So this is a case which had severe combination, 38-year-old male. Um, the uh, hip was dislocated and uh, it could be wedged between the, uh, the two columns and could get a stable uh, intraoperative fixation. And this is the follow-up. So how often does open erection internal fixation of geriatric acetabular fracture lead to hip arthroplasty? This seminal paper showed that one-year mortality was 25%. And rate of conversion to arthroplasty after ORIF was 28% at two and a half year for the geriatric age group. And which is uh, led us particularly because the Indian patients are more morbid with lesser life expectancy. Uh, we have uh, uh, published our uh, work uh, frequently. This was the acute total hip arthroplasty in elderly. Uh, we, we used the, uh, the uh, uh, octopus cage, which has since been uh, discontinued. But then this will always allow you to uh, sort of restore the bone stock and uh, and restore the center of rotation of the hip. With the availability of modern uh, multi-hole, modern porous metal cups, uh, it has become uh, easier if you like to, uh, to fix these uh, fractures and the problems. And very often we would use an additional plate uh, for uh, acute total hip arthroplasty in these cases. Uh, the 56-year-old male with uh, acute fracture dislocation right hip and uh, again, modern porous cups could be used. Another case of polytrauma had a fracture of the distal femur on the same side, and the uh, uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the acetabular fracture on the opposite side. Um, so we have published our results of acute total hip arthroplasty using modern porous cup. 18 patients, they use the Regenex cup, which has now been uh, discontinued. Um, 48 months follow-up showed excellent results. Uh, if we have a acetabular fraction, elderly, uh, particularly in Indian scenario, um, a comorbid with uh, a high risk for surgery where, uh, where you want to do one surgery to get him up and about immediately uh, to provide adequate fixation and early mobilization. So this is an example, acetabular fracture with severe combination, not uh, amenable to uh, reconstruction. Uh, we use the cup cage construct, we use the trabecular metal shell, we remove the ring so that it allows us to put the screws at the very periphery uh, uh, and to get the hold into the bone where it's possible. And then because we don't have the original um, cage available with us in India, we use a Bur Schneider cage as, a, uh, as an innovation and then we uh, put in a liner and then put the whole lot of bone here to, re to restore the uh, the uh, bone stock, and this is a follow-up of the same patient. 72-year-old female had acetabular fracture with acute pelvic discontinuity. You can see uh, the head was actually quite damaged, uh, did this surgery, and it dislocated. Now, this is a very depressing scenario, but not at all rare. The bony landmarks are actually quite compromised in complex fractures. The possibly the uh, it's easy to put the components in bad orientation, and then of course sometimes there's the natony of muscles or the injury to the muscle uh, 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 neural supply. So we did uh, close reduction and give a hip abduction brace. So uh, we have published our series of cup cage construct using porous cup with Bush Schneider cage in management of complex acetabular fractures and. Uh, uh, we In eight patients, we had one dislocation. This is another case operated previously, uh, early fixation failure, and uh, we did the, uh, the cup cage construct. Surely enough, it dislocated. Two attempts were made at close reduction, and then we had to revise with a constrained liner. So I started with cementing a ZCA 28 millimeter head in the cup cage, went on to um, constrained liner, then went on to a trilogy, acetabular liner with 36 millimeter head because you won't get the 36 millimeter cemented cups and you could get them in as small a size as 50 millimeter. And then we moved on to the dual mobility. So quick word about the cementing dual mobility in this cup cage construct. And uh, this is an example. Uh, and you can see the dual mobility cup was cemented. So we have uh, our own series of um, cup cage construct uh, with acute pelvic discontinuity, 26 patients. Initial 12 we did with uh, ZCA and Trilogy liner. We had two dislocations. 
And the last 14 cases, we have cemented a dual mobility cup without any dislocation and 100% survivorship at two years. Uh, so um, this is a paper uh, in which uh, we have uh, written about our um, experience and recommendations. To summarize, totally partroplasty in acetabular fracture is a challenge. Infection should be ruled out. It needs meticulous planning. And uh, uh, it, the challenges are hardware, obtaining long-term acetabular component fixation, and making sure that the risk of dislocation is low. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would now uh, invite um, Dr. Vivek Trikha for a complex uh, uh, acetabular fracture case uh, presentation. Dr. Vivek. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. So now we go to a complex case in the acetabular fracture. He was a 26-year-old soldier, had a motor vehicle accident when he had come to his hometown. And he had this sort of an x-ray with which he came to us, had a fracture of the acetabular region, and also he had some injuries to his knee and his one of his elbows. So it looks like a complex fracture of an acetabulum involving both the columns which we can see. Once he was stabilized, we got his other x-rays done. And these were his inlet, outlet and the obturator views also which you can see. This is his CT scan the two-dimensional CT scan, the axial scans where you see that there is a lot of combination, especially where the columns are broken, both the columns are broken out there and there is another component or a com combination component out there. Along with that, what we see is that there is also a femoral head fracture, which we can see out here. If you look at the coronal images, Again, we see that the head fragment is also a big fragment on the first ones. And also there is a lot of combination at the acetabular column region at the quadrilateral plate where this fracture has happened. And this is what we see in the CT scans as well, a femoral head fracture along with most likely a dislocated hip a subluxated and dislocation of the hip joint and the femoral head lying outside on the posterior aspect with combination and probably a T-type fracture of the acetabulum. So any comments regarding this diagnosis as well as the fracture pattern? I mean that's a that's a that's a tough problem just because the you know you hate to see a femoral head injured like that and you can really yeah. see it pretty clearly in your upper left image you know you see that yes, exactly. head hearing yeah. injury <clears throat> which you saw in the initial film as well yeah I mean I think you know you have to just how old was the patient I missed that he's twenty six a soldier who <laughs> has come back to his hometown for his vacations yeah so you're gonna you're gonna want to fix this you know if this was a 70 year old, a 65 yeah. year old with that femoral head injury, you may be looking at a primary orthoplasty, I think in, in preference, but for a young patient, I would, I would move to fixing this. So I think, you know, when I look at this and it's, it's a very quick look, um, you know, but I think your, your, your best reads, as you can see on that middle image at the top is sort of your anterior column, right? Your anterior column is your best read. <clears throat> so I, I think I would probably approach this with a dual, with a dual sequential approaches. I think there's a lot of options here. Mm -hmm. There are people who would do go directly to a, um, a lateral approach with a, with a flip. And I think that's the other way to do it. Um, but, but to me that, that, Although it gives you good visualization of the anterior column, it doesn't give you a lot of ways to reduce the anterior column. <clears throat> so I think I would probably go to the front. I would do the I would do the anterior uh, ring where that really good read is and get that back in place. So I'd have something to work to, and then I'd go to the back and I would do a trochanteric flip with a surgical dislocation uh, to fix the rest of the joint and the femoral head. Um, but you know, you, you know, I could see doing this. 10 other ways, right? This is terrible yeah. injury. So let's ask Hassan also his opinion regarding what, how he's going to approach this fracture. Yeah, I think I would, I would, uh, I'd probably just go from the back from the start and do the trochosteotomy because I think that uh, if you go from the front and you do that stage and you, you, I agree with 
Paul, that, that that's the easiest reduction. But then if you can't get the hip reduced and if you, and, and you have to stage it and you, on different days, do you really want to leave the head out of the back and et cetera? Yeah. So I'd want to get the hip reduced. And I think that with the hip dislocated, you can actually get the anterior column reduced pretty easily with the, with the head, not in the, in the socket. So I would, I would, uh, I would probably try to do this all from, from, uh, from the back. Okay. So you, you will be going all from the back in the initial stance and you you are expecting that you will be able to fix the anterior column also from the back with the truck flip. Yeah, I think, I think that especially with the truck flip and the head still out of the socket, you can actually manipulate the anterior column and get it reduced and possibly fix okay. it with an anterior column screw and then not have to do the second stage in the front. Okay. So do you so do that? So it's on, you're going to do, are you going to do a surgical dislocation or are you just doing the trochanteric osteotomy to give yourself more anterior exposure? Probably. So I'd want to plan it more, but I think that, um, I think I would, it's already dislocated. So if you can get the femoral headpiece out with the hip already sitting dislocated, I'd probably try to do it without messing with the troke at all. But then if you can't get it and can't uh, rotate and reduce, then yeah, I would add, I'd probably add uh, the surgical dislocation. I think the capsule here is torn. The posterior wall is, a, it looks like another piece. I think that you're going to be able to see the whole head from the back. Okay. Dr. Uh, anybody else would like to comment? If not, then what, what I would like to ask both you, Paul and Hassan is, which is the fragment would you like to fix first? Because I thought that maybe would you like to fix the femur first or the establum or the femoral head? If it is lying dislocated, you might as well fix the femur first. Do you think that will be a right option or we go in for the establum first? Yeah, I think so. I think if you're, if you're doing it the way I do it, which would be to, to get the sure thing first, right? right? So if I get the sure thing first, which is in the front, you know, that's a, that's a very easy operation and it's 100% predictable. And you're going to be able to dislocate out the back irrespective of what you do in the front if you choose to do a surgical yeah. dislocation, right? So I'm not worried about, about having trouble with that. And I wouldn't do it in separate days because the front takes, you know, that's a half hour, right? Oh. Half hour, 40 minutes. If it's a quick operation, <clears throat> and then I would turn it and do it, do it the same day. I might even do it just in the lateral position. If it was a small patient, do it in the lateral position, do the anterior mm -hmm. approach lateral, push that down, and then just go right to the surgical dislocation. Um, so if I'm doing it that way, I would do the anterior acetabulum first. Then I would do the hip, you know, the femur next, but I would, I would, I would do a surgical dislocation if I had to. And I think, I think I would have to, I, I don't think that I could manipulate those intraarticular fragments well without seeing the joint well. And when you have a hip that's dislocated posteriorly, while it sounds great, you can't see anything in the front. Exactly. So I, although I can't, maybe someone else does a better job than me, but I, I would have to strip too much. So to me, I would have to do a surgical dislocation to do it. And then the order doesn't matter. You know, sometimes with the surgical dislocation, having nothing in the way and not fixing the head, the S tabin would be easier to fix at that point, but it makes no difference what order you choose. If you've done a dislocation, you can do it in either order. And it's basically the same thing. If you're doing it from the back and, and you're trying to keep the hip dislocated and somehow be able to kind of see around it, then, you know, fixing the hip second would make sense because you'll have better visualization before you put the piece back. But I, I, don't, I just don't think I could do that. I don't think I because, could do that. I don't think predictably I could do it. Because if you see that the posterior column is broken and is widely displaced out there. So even if we are doing a surgical dislocation beforehand, where exactly it is going to stabilize? We are not able to see anything out there. And your reduction right. as such and right, the stability right. pattern is also difficult. Right. And you can, you can clip the posterior column right through the coker portion of your yeah. surgical dislocation before you do your capsulotomy or dislocation. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. You can, definitely do the, you can definitely do the column first, but I wouldn't definitively fix it because the, the advantage of the dislocation is to be able to Exposure. see the joint. So yeah. clip it, maybe a lag screw, something simple, a little push plate, but I, but I wouldn't okay. do a formal definitive fixation. Okay. Hassan, any, anything further? Any more comments? No, I mean, I, I think that um, it likely would require the surgical dislocation from the back. And if you're doing that anyway, then I just I just think that your anterior column is not going to be that hard to reduce from from the back, even okay. if you if you've done the dislocation. So. Right. So this is what we were discussing, the approach for the stablum and the femoral head, which one to tackle first and the sequence. And as you said, Paul said that you can tackle it whichever way you want. 
you have got all the fractures which you want to fix you can go anterior you can go posterior you have the femur so whichever one you want to fix you can have it as it toss so my plan was something similar to the posterior part i would say i normally keep whenever i have this fracture complex fracture the best thing is what i do in my thing is break it down into simpler constituents and then treat them one after the other and that's what we did keep it simple procedure because it was a dislocation of the hip of the posterior side along with the more displaced column which i thought that i might should be able to reduce it initially as early as possible so that was the first thing which i thought i will be doing with reduction of the hip and tackling the most post displaced column once i get a stabilized posterior column then i can fix the femoral head through the same exposure if required as i said flip osteotomy and as was there that if my reduction of the anterior column is anatomical out here then i might go in and put in an fire in a screw out there when i am seeing it else i will go and reverse the procedure and go in again with a lateral window with an asi osteotomy and fix in my anterior fracture because what was worrying me was the combination at that area if you see that where the fractures are held both at the anterior as well as the posterior column there is a lot of combination and flake of bone so that i wanted to visualize it right in front of my eyes to get that i am able to get the accurate reduction because here for me there was no chance of inaccuracy even a minor one because that's three fractures which we are dealing with and even a minor discrepancy on one side is going to exaggerate the things and the functional outcome is going to remember that we are dealing with three fractures out here which can have a direct impact on the functional outcome so that's the thing which i would like for the audience to also remember that we have to keep it break it down make it in the best way possible so this is what we went about in a lateral position if we see this is the greater trochanter i remove the fragments which were there or which we needed to with a small intra articular fragments the posterior and the cephalad way reduced it and then went about fixing my posterior column after the reduction you can see that fracture is there with the ischial spin standard ischial tuberosity the the reduction of the posterior column how is it done the same way i tried to re rotate that fragment was not able to get that displacement properly reduced and compressed so for that use the ferroboff procedure again the same principle the simple how to do a posterior column and once i was able to get that adequate compression of it then the fixation was done i fixed it beforehand made it into now a fixed posterior side and since it was already there i did a flip osteotomy now and fixed it the this was the reduction which i got i was able to get an anatomical reduction of the posterior column so once i was happy with that i fixed it then converted it into a pure cockle lengbeck or a flip osteotomy fracture with a femoral head fracture and with a surgical dislocation saw this fragment which is there reduced it and put in some herbert or hcs headless screws out here but what i want to ask from you people out here is many a times when we have this femoral head fractures we see this sort of an abrasion of the articular cartilage on the media on the side and mostly you cannot see this fixation of these screws is best with a flip osteotomy and not through kl because that exposure of that area is not there it is inferior medial anterior medial inferior part so what i know there are osteochondral grafts or fresh frozen but what do you do in your practice regarding these big abrasions and which are just abrasions on your acetabular cartilage what is your experience in this paul hasan yeah I, frankly i don't i don't have a lot of experience doing i mean i i think we've done three or four surgical dislocations for acetabular fractures like it's just not a common operation for yeah. us um the times when we would do it is if there's a femoral head injury with sort of a small posterior wall this this would be a great indication for it like i said but but it's an uncommon problem so i i would you know i would drill it and we we haven't done anything more aggressive like putting acute okay. osteochondral fragments on now if if it's salvageable and you know if it's if it's in the roof that's a different question right so if it's really if it's in the weight bearing surface mm -hmm. that's 
that's a little bit different. This looks like it's not quite yeah. reaching the roof, although it's hard for me to get the orientation not being there. But it seems like the roof is more to the left this is the the interior, yeah. right? So I, that area looks pretty good to me. So I think if it's in the roof, you've got a really big issue. And then you may consider it, but if it's more on the side of the head, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really like that. about it too aggressive at that point. Okay. But I, I don't. I can't say that I have a lot of experience to say that's the right answer. Hassan, uh, you had experience in this? Yeah. So uh, again, I've I've I'm similar to Paul as far as fixing femoral heads with a uh, with a uh, surgical dislocation. I've done a handful. I fix most of my femoral heads from an anterior approach. Yeah. And so you can still see that the cartilage is is you know is sloughed from the front. But as far as what to do with it, I've drilled them just because it makes me feel better. I don't know that it actually does anything for the patient. And then certainly my discussion with the patient is, hey, your cartilage was torn up, so you, you're you're likely to get arthritis in your hip in the future. Mm -hmm. But in this case where the posteriorly, we had to go for the posterior, I think doing a truck flip was a natural further thing which we could have done. Yes, yeah, very, very good plan. Yeah. So the next thing was I would try to get my reduction, but was not able to get the accurate reduction of the anterior column. So as I said, I wanted to get the best. And as Paul said, it is just 45 minutes for an anterior side to just fix it. And this is what we fixed it through with lateral window with ASI osteotomy. And what I want to show out here is that this is the beauty of that, that if you want, you can put in your plate so medially before lateral to the iliopectineal eminence and the iliopectineal fascia with the psoas acting as your cushion against the vessels and the fascia that if you want, you can put in one or two screws, even medial to the hip joint and give it stability. If you don't want to put in your anterior to anterior screw, I put it here both. And as was able to get with that plate, the combination was able to be properly reduced. Anterior column was reduced. And then one screw going even medial to it on the hip joint, which gives it sort of a bone clamp sort of a thing fixation which I was able to get. Yes, dual fixation, but it is hardly a morbidity, I would say, because it's a small operation. It takes is finished within half 45 minutes. We can get that. This is his X-ray after two months. You can see that ASI is osteotomy. So I think I can fix those ASI osteotomies, Hassan, and the truck and trick flip as well. So what we find out here is this heterotrophic ossification. And that brings me to the next question, which I would like to ask from all of you. What is your preventive method? Is there anything which you would like the audience to know how to prevent this heterotrophic ossification in such a complex injury and for that matter, even in a small injury as well? Yeah, so yeah. I don't use uh, any radiation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use Indocin anymore either. I just do uh, an aggressive debridement of uh, minimus and then even some medius at the end of the case. So at the beginning of the case, I'll take out a lot of minimus to help visualization for reduction, et cetera. But then at the end of the case, I really also look at the medius. And if there's some medius that even that looks really bad, uh, I, I tend to excise it as well. Okay. No yeah, radiotherapy? It's a, really, yeah. it's a really good question. And, it, you know, if you look at all the statistics, right, it's the things that correlate basically are all the things that say that the, that the posterior musculature has been damaged, right? So it's T-shaped fractures, male gender, displacement, posterior approach, like everything adds up to the same dislocation. So, you know, this is a muscle reaction issue as, as Hassan alluded to. So I, I do a very similar thing to him is that I, I, I do a lot. I actually do a fair amount of medius debridement. I'm, I, you know, the minimus comes out, people say they do the minimus debridement, but really that's just like getting the exposure, right? So I don't, I guess it's part of the exposure, but I do, you know, I use a Charlie retractor and I take all of the, I take all of the dead medius and all of the questionable medius. It's not that much, but you know, a centimeter on each side I take routinely. Uh, you know, a while back, Joel Matta did a really nice study of Indocin and, and looked at, at 3D CAT scanning to look at the volume of uh, heterotopic ossification. And it didn't seem to be different with Indocin, but it was a little bit lower, but not statistically different. I have seen, uh, you know, a couple of patients in my career, which I did all the same surgical stuff. And I've only had two really bad HOs, one that I resected uh, when I was in New York and one here in Boston. And and both of those patients didn't take Indocin, even though I prescribed it. So the downside of the Indocin is just the GI upset and bleeding and things like that. And I, I still give it because I think that the, the risk of giving it is very low. And I'm, I'm unconvinced based on the power of the study and the statistics 
that it's that it's not helpful. Uh, there was just a recent study of looking at out of uh, I think I think your guy Quaid did it right, uh, <clears throat> Son, the guy who trained in Tampa, um, yes. looking at hemostatic uh, um, um, application yeah. and showing a lower rate of HO with that. And I've actually yeah. started to incorporate that. So I think that was a that was a really nice study because they used it for something else and found like this accidental covariant that that seemed to be helpful. So I think that's something people should consider as well. Yeah, that surgery cell or things like that, which you are. <coughs> yeah, surgery cell. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, so I think, think that that's very important discussion. And uh, we operate on a lot of ankylosing spondylitis patients where they are at a very high risk for uh, uh, for developing HO. So we have routinely used uh, indomethacin and uh, it's pretty safe. I would not radiate a young male. Uh, you know, I'm quite reluctant to do that. But I think the key points uh, which have been highlighted already are. No, not leaving any dead muscle. They are removing minimus right at the beginning, debriding any dead tissue, not leaving a uh, hematoma there, you know. So, I mean, that is known to uh, give rise to the, uh, the problem and the reason, and hence the utility of hemostatic agent. Uh, and uh, we also give it a good wash, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to prevent any uh, debris being there and starting eliciting any uh, this thing. And really, we have not seen a very significant... Uh, 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 heterotopic ossification. Vivek, what about you? How many Uri Brooker three or four uh, oh, serious yeah. uh, severe HO you have seen? Oh, we have seen quite a one, quite a bit because most of our cases are polytraumatized with head injury as well, and that many of a, them are having. Game, and yeah. if we are operating on them with a cocker lengen back. And the other thing which I see and which I would like to ask also is that most of our HO which we find is going anterior which is for the minimus part. Anterior. If you see, get a CT scan also, it is going from the anterior inferior iliac spine and that region towards the anterior where the gluteus minimus is going and attaching. And that we are rebriding mostly from the posterior aspect where the injury has happened. But as you would see here also, if you see a lateral view, if you can see this lateral where the reduction of the posterior side is okay, but the anteriorly you are having that heterotrophic ossification. This was his six months follow-up and he had some knee issues as well, as you could see. And there was a calcification with the mediac condyle pellegrini stradus out of a thing which was not having his knee movements. But you could see that he was able to flex his hip and do an abduction of the hip to a great extent. At one year, he is having a HO of this much. And you could see that as I was showing and asking you, it's on the interior aspect, mostly on the interior aspect because the medial and the central aspect, we have all debrided. But how interior you go is the question for debridement. And at this moment, when do you, my next question is, if you need to do an HO removal, what is the thing which you are going to look for? Do you look for that maturation or a cold yeah. or hot thing? So, or you just so go and debride it? Yeah, I've, I've done only, so again, my experience is limited. I've done two HO removals in my life. Uh, both of them were were much more significant amount of bone than this. Like they were they were a fair amount. Of, and one of them, you know, I did I did the same thing. I got a CAT scan to understand exactly the anatomy. And and one of them, the sciatic nerve was going through the freaking yeah. bone. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I ended up having to like find the nerve at the notch. And then you know, it, I think it took me six hours to take out the bone, three of which was chipping away everything next to the nerve because it was it was contained in about three centimeters long of a tube of bone. Like it was just exactly. completely encased. And that's, man, that, that was very unpleasant. And the patient didn't lose function, but it was, it was really, I was, I was scared to death, honestly, when I was doing it. And then afterwards I do radiate those patients. So I, I put them in the obturator oblique position. I go over to the RT place myself and I like put them in a position, get an X-ray and I draw out on their screen where I want the radiation to be. So they don't actually get the hip because they don't, they don't do a lot of it. So, you know, it requires actual, your own personal intervention to walk your ass over there and, and do it. Um, but that, that's been my, you know, very limited experience and uh, neither of them came back, but I gave them both a single shot of 600 gray um, and, and endomethacin. I, I don't know if that's the right thing, but that's what I did. Hassan, so, yeah. what about uh, head injury? You know, I mean, I would like to ask you guys, uh, that's a real problem, isn't it? I mean, getting, uh, we get very florid uh, heterotopic ossification in polytrauma patients with head injury. And uh, do you have any special tricks up your sleeve, something you do in your center? 
Yeah. So that's the one where, you know, uh, so uh, my experience with HO excision is actually half of Paul's. I've, on, I've only done one and it was also a miserable experience. <laughs> so, but that what I do, especially in head injured patients <clears throat> is a lot of times, you know, as the, uh, as the attending surgeon, you're kind of there for fixation. And then you may want to just kind of go while your fellow or resident or assistants close up, but I make sure I stay beyond fixation and actually stay there, especially with a head injured polytrauma patient to do the debridement of muscle myself, because I feel that sometimes more junior colleagues will be less aggressive with that muscular debridement at the end. So I, I, in particular with head injured polytrauma, I stay and do that muscular debridement myself and make sure I'm part of it to make sure it's, uh, that I feel comfortable with it. Well, great. I think yeah. gentlemen, we have to move on. Uh, do you have I, anything I else? Just, I'll just off. finish it off by saying that Yes, at three and a half years, I had not gone for an HO removal out here because he was fine. You could see that his range of motion had improved. He was able to sit and sit cross-legged and squat, even with this amount of Brooker classification, grade three, grade four sort of a classified grade. He could abduct. Even he could externally rotate both his limbs. The only problem was his internal rotation, which he was not having. You could see all the movements of his Classically, only internal rotation is not. And he said, I don't have any problems with this. I don't want any further surgeries. Yeah. And I, just to I, I agree. Yeah, that's a I, really great result. I'd ask Dr. Malhotra what you think about that hardware and HO for your future total hip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, that's a terrible thing, you know, to go through that HO. I will possibly radiate that patient if I do HO, I, if I do total hip in that, because one of the risk factors for HO is when the patient is already existing. Uh, bone there and you go and remove and those are the cases who will need radiation definitely. Right, right. Thank you. I'll just finish it off by saying that in the end the take home for this is that in a complex injury proper planning and knowledge of the fracture pattern keep it simple, approach the injury step by step, maintaining your accuracy good results with right approach and anatomical reduction but you always counsel the patient for achieving the best outcomes. Thank you. So now I invite uh, Paul for uh, for the uh, complex acetabular fracture cases. Paul, the stage is yours. You're unmuted, Paul. Well, that, that was helpful, Hassan. Thanks. <laughs> so first one, I have two cases. The first one is uh, basically healthy, somewhat larger individual, MBA, had a chest injury, but, you know, no, no real problems with oxygenation. He's stable. No bowel or bladder. He had an S-tabulum and a, and a both bone uh, with no, no compartment syndrome in his, uh, in his forearm. Uh, <clears throat> so this was his presentation AP. Um, and, and I present this just for the, the discussion around sort of clamp placement and predictable problems. And not that this is a highly complicated problem. Um, it's a basic transverse pattern, as you see. But when you see the SI join off, you have to be very careful. So I've seen people do, you know, miss that because once the hip gets reduced, the SI joint looks better, right? So here you can see presentation AP. So, you know, initially we put it in traction. I think that's a good idea. You know, I'm not sure if anybody else uses angiography. <clears throat> if someone has a, a problem that goes into the notch, we get a CTA when they go through, but this one didn't get it. Um, and I don't think there's any, any real urgency to it. So we put a traction pin. The SI joint still looks a little bit wide. Sometimes these, though, will look really pretty good once the hip is reduced. And I think that what, people get tricked into doing these like in the prone position the SI joint opens and then you can't get your transverse reduced. So people who do them lateral or supine are probably in a little bit better shape. Uh, this was just the both bones that we, we also fixed. So here you can see the plain films. It's a sort of a transtectal transverse. It's more oblique than most coming out a little bit more inferior at, at the uh, bottom. So here's the SI joint <clears throat> and here's your, uh, here's your dislocation. I mean, your, your transverse. So I guess I'd ask what, what approach would people use? Do you do the SI joint first, same time? Do you do it extended? Uh, do you flip? Do you do an ilioinguinal or a, or a stop, uh, dual approaches? What would, what would people pick for this basic, you know, transtectal transverse, very oblique with an SI joint? <coughs> mm. 
can i in my hands i would like if it is a very high fracture these are the transfers which are very high the transtectal ones or the top ones you i will like to go it from a anterior approach and use it with an asis osteotomy using this not just the lateral with an asis osteotomy combining it with smith peterson sort of a thing so that i can medialize my psoas much more it helps me to get that rotation the external rotation of my iliac fragment back into its place properly which i can visualize from my anterior visualization of the si joint with a shan spin or a iliac crest or an aias shan spin which i can derotate it and then i can put in my plate as i showed in my talk also and to fire in two screws from the anterior to the posterior one after getting with a collinear clamp maybe uh, putting in this so that is i don't normally go anterior for transverse fractures i normally go posterior because that's what is the common approach for a transverse but for this fracture with a high column both anterior and posterior <coughs> i tend to go anterior nowadays with an asis osteotomy combining with smith peterson so i would uh, that will help you address the sacroiliac joint as well yes with a reduction as well as the screw fixation if required yeah. so i think either um supine or prone i would certainly fix the i would fix the si joint first with a percutaneous screw um which i probably it would be easier to do supine because you wouldn't have the deformity force of uh, on the ilium but even prone you can you can probably get it with a percutaneous screw i think that the piece that worries me a little bit and the, the fact that he has bilateral both bones or even if it was unilateral that you want to probably address i'd like to do it supine which means i would probably go from the front just to get everything done there's there's a one on a few different views there's been a free piece that uh that I can't quite figure out where exactly that is so yeah so that that piece I would want to kind of study the CT more to see how big that is if that's something I'm going to go after to you mean, also you mean try this, to you mean this here Hassan yeah that's that so I yeah you didn't have the advantage of going through that's actually just part of the roof that's attached um that's attached to okay, the Okay, so it's uh, not a separate the, fragment. It's not yeah, it's not I'll just tell you it's not a separate fragment. Okay, then but I, I had to do that, that, that same evaluation. Yeah, I had to yeah, do that. If that same was a separate fragment. Yeah, if that was a separate fragment, that would really <clears throat> probably drive my decision a lot more hand then where is that fragment so I can access it and fix it with a separate uh, uh intraarticular implant, but yeah. Yeah, so I think you could go either way with this uh prone or supine, fix the SI joint first. To then be able to reduce the transverse. <coughs> yep. So I, I agree, and and uh, my choice was do the same time do ilioinguinal. Um, I think I think I could do a Smith Pete with a you know with an osteotomy as well. I'm really comfortable with the ilioinguinal. It's not it didn't take me very long. But what I, what I point out is that when you have these exactly what you said, Dr. Trickett, it, all the transverses I do you know prone. The one I do supine is when you have a transtectal with a high obliquity. They're very difficult to do from the back. That's actually the pattern that Lauderdale recommended doing, you know, transtectals through an extended approach, which is why I put the flip in there as an option, because he felt it was so important to get the roof of the joint perfect that they did extended iliofemorals for these as a routine. <clears throat> so I've, I've been pretty happy doing them from the front. <clears throat> but my issue is, you know, whenever I try to reduce this over, uh, you're pushing over on the SI joint. So you've got to get the SI joint first. I think a screw in the front of the SI joint makes very little sense. So I, I just played it, right? So it doesn't, it's a type two injury. You put a screw in, you're not in the correct corridor unless you put an Ehler screw in, which makes sense, but I don't really like doing that. Um, so those are sort of the problems that I see. So I go for the SI joint first. So I'm doing that upper window anyway. So I just put a little plate on the front of the SI joint. It takes about five minutes and that's, that's very easy. And that locks in your rotation. So now you can get your reduction. So that, that's my own personal preference. And then <clears throat> I'm going to try to get this, uh, this transverse reduced. And again, you've got this plane. And the problem when you put a clamp on and push it this way is it tends to slide. So these very oblique ones on the AP radiograph with that quite vertical axis, you put this clamp on or a collinear clamp or something else, and you can see that fragment that Hassan was talking about is now lateralized compared to the roof what it's supposed to be next to, right? It's shifted this way. And that's a tough thing to control through just an anterior approach. Like if you're in the modified stoppa, the AIP, you're just pushing over, which makes it worse. So this clamp, to me, I always end up having to put a second clamp. 
So this is where I like the ileo because it's very easy for me to place this clamp to compress the fracture this way while I'm compressing it over. And that always enables me to get a perfect reduction. Whereas when I do this through anything besides the ileo I just I feel like I struggle a lot more. This is a pretty quick step. And then you can get an accurate reduction and you can place a percutaneous screw. And you can see that, that how these things are bent. The amount of force to reduce that accurately to get it line to line is actually quite a lot. Um, so I show it just because I think that while the fracture is not that complicated, the deforming forces actually present a fairly difficult scenario. And then I, I did the same thing you did. I, I put that little plate on. I, I lagged into the posture column as well, um, as you can see here. And this was sort of the, the final post-ops. And, uh, and he went on to, to, do, to do pretty well. But I think it's an interesting pattern when you have these combination injuries. Any, any closing comments, Hassan or, or Dr. Tricka, anything that uh, – how do you deal with that from the AIP? How do you deal with that compressive? Do you put a different clamp like on the inside to compress similar to what I did, Hassan, or do you, do you, do you yeah, just add it? I've actually window? used um, a fair booth. <laughs> a young booth through the AIP. It's not easy, but, but you can do it. Um, but, yeah. but it helps uh, prevent that shear. Uh, yeah, so I think you're double clamping it as well. Then you're basically clamping it superiorly and then across. Yes. Yeah. If you do an ASIS or Shortney or a Smith Peterson, that fragment, which is there in the roof can be very, and the interior wall area, you can see it very properly because that's how you look for your femoral head yep. fracture. Yep. So yep. I think that, a lateral window with a spinty <coughs> combined with an osteotomy is going to give you that entire exposure of all the dome area which you want here. And maybe if you want another clamp from that place, we can still get it. So I usually, very, very usually used to use ilioinguinal, but for many of these fractures, because they are so lateral to the iliopectineal eminence, that now many of these fractures I feel like still can just come out with osteotomy and smith p and not go through the inguinal ligament right. and so your second problem. clamp your second clamp would just be on the anterior part of the acetabulum under direct vision yes the, the key is so that so here you have three surgeons doing it three different ways but again <laughs> the that's perfect because the principles for all three approaches right are the same you've got to get compression as well superior to anterior as well as medial to lateral and, that, and that's what people don't recognize so that's that's good that's good <coughs> So here's a, a little more of a, a bad case. So this is a 52-year-old, really pleasant woman uh, who had this injury. So I'll let you look at that for a second because it's not, it's not a quick evaluation. <coughs> and here's, uh, here's the oblique. So it's obviously a both column, but also there's an iliac wing fracture, right? So it's not isolated to that with a lot of comminution, a separate posterior wall fragment that you can see, and, and a lot of medial comminution of the quadrilateral surface. And, and I show this just, you know, you can see a separate roof fragment there that's like in Nowheresville. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I do a lot of these, like this is one of my five worst things I've ever dealt with. So it's not like it's not like, oh, he does these all the time. <laughs> Nobody does these all the time, I hope. So here's the, the CAT scan, just sort of showing what we're talking about. The SI joints, thankfully, I thought were okay. That looked a little funny to me, um, you know, but I wanted to evaluate it. And here you can see these separate fragments, uh, separate roof fragment, separate posterior wall fragment, you know, all of which are not large with a tremendous amount of comminution. I think it's similar to the case, Dr. Dr. Tricky, you show, but a little more intraarticular comminution. So here's the 3D to give you <clears throat> sort of an idea of what we're dealing with. Now she's 52, right? You know, the other thing is a, you know, a, a segmental posterior column, which makes things exceptionally difficult. <clears throat> um, and you can see that, that separate roof fragment uh, through, the, through the fracture site there. So what do you guys, what do you guys think of that? Yeah. So obviously a <coughs> highly comminuted complex both column with, you know, the segmental posture column is just, it's so hard to deal with. If, it, if it's just 
a both column fracture that happens to have a wall component, I don't worry about that as much because it's not the same as a regular posterior wall, right? And you can try to actually capture it and get a screw in from intrapelvic to capture it. But but the segmental posterior column makes me think with this, if I'm truly going to try to get it anatomic, it's going to have to be uh, uh, front back. So I'd probably start with front with uh, AIP lateral window, try to reconstruct the anterior column, try to get the dome segment uh, you know, back best I can. And then uh, likely we'll end up having to flip prone and, and go from the back to get the posterior column and that wall. So in a 52 year old, would, would anybody be considering a primary joint, you know, reconstruct from a, you know, whatever anterior approach you like uh, and then, and then do a total joint in a 52 year old. What are your, what are your thoughts? What does everybody think? The damage is severe enough to warrant. However, I think with uh, what is more important here <coughs> is uh, uh, equally important. I would say is to uh, is to fix the IEM because I think you uh, uh, in many in many cases I think it's preferable to start restoring uh, the anatomy from where it works the best. And in any case, to deconstruct the entire acetabulum, start fixing from the IEM and uh, fix anteriorly. And I think. Even if you wanted to do a primary total lip in this, you would have to fix the fragment. It's not something which uh, I would get away with the cupcake. I think I would need uh, the fracture to be fixed. And if the head is too damaged, put the plates in and then do a joint replacement. So fixation yeah. has to be done still. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Trucker, any, any, yeah, any, the, uh, no, the same thing. I'll go anterior, whichever way, Stopa <coughs> with a lateral, with a ASIS or shot me. That is going to help me again fix that crucial dome fragment, I'll reduce the hip first. Once I reduce the hip joint and get my ASIS or anterior inferior spine bone, which is the dome bone proper, then I'll see whether my reconstruction is possible or not because that fragment of the dome is a small one with a major fragment of the anterior inferior spine. Once the femoral head is back to its place, it may fall back for me and then I just have to do a ilioinguinal or a stopa with a lateral Smith P and fix it with things. So the posterior you, segmental, your, posterior column will be tackled later. I wouldn't have done <coughs> it as Hassan said, but because it's a column with segmental, I might not put in screws from the front. I might have to go from the back. There is likely yeah. to be significant head damage as well. I mean, Paul can tell what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about being able to evaluate that. I figured as soon as I opened it, I see the, I no. see the head. So I, was, I, mean, I yeah, figured I'd I, know the answer to that pretty quickly. Um, yeah, this was. I mean, honestly, I lost a lot of sleep uh, thinking about this patient. I, and I explained to her, look, I think there's so much damage. I, I don't expect that I'm going to be able to get it anatomic. You know, I honestly didn't think I could do that. And I told her that we were going to restore bony stability, get the best we could, and that she would likely need a total hip within a few years. And we're going to do everything we could to avoid creating a situation where that would be difficult. Uh, that was sort of my own, you know, my own view of, of, of this injury because of the level of comminution. <clears throat> so these are all the. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I tell my trainees with this is that, you know, this isn't going to be our standard fixation construct. There are going to be a lot of little plates <laughs> in places and you're going to have multiple plates and it's just going to look like a, like a hardware shop when it's done. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this was the added, this is the added bonus is that she had a big morel of LA. I know I saved that for the end. So I had planned not to go to the back no matter what. Right. That that was sort of the plan was to figure out whatever I could do from the front. And I wasn't going to go to the back because I had just deathly afraid that if I went in here, debris, it did everything that it, if it got infected, then she's got no recourse. Where so so now you're restricted to just the best you can do from the front, which, again, was one of the reasons I lost sleep. So, you know, again, the femoral head's pretty easy to see. And surprisingly, there, there was not a lot of damage on the head. I was I mean, I was shocked to see that the head didn't look. Terrible. I'm sure there is, you know, some some cell death, but <clears throat> so I, I did as as you said, uh, Dr. Mahal. I, I went to the to the back, and I always start at the iliac crest. Also, that was the only thing I had any confidence that I could reduce. So I felt pretty good about that. And and you can see that you know that separate roof fragment still, you know, on even on these views. So we went to the crest, uh, and then sort of built back. So here you can see some some crest fixation, some clamps. You still see that roof that, that roof piece is not quite right. Um, that's a that's a uh, a clamp. I mean, that's reaching around the back 
just like Hassan, what you said, you can oftentimes get to the post your wall through that approach. So I reached around the back. Um, luckily, it didn't get into the, the hematoma and was trying to just kind of push that down and get it reduced so I could capture it somehow. And we eventually got it. You know, I grabbed it with like a K wire and pushed on it. And I don't know. I felt like I was doing a trying to reduce a fracture dislocation of the talus where I'm not sure exactly what I did at the end, but it sort of looked better. Uh, so some kind of magic happened and, and some luck came in. Maybe she's just a nice person, <clears throat> but we got it to the point where I thought it was reasonably good. And there you see that vertical posterior wall. And, and I agree completely with Hassan. These posterior walls associated with both columns are vertical and you can usually lag them from the front or even slide a plate down from the, the back and then put a perk screw across, but you don't need to do a coker to get to it. So it started to look a little better at this point. You can see a lot of pushing and pulling. Every uh, everything that you see that looks like a, a a pushing thing is just me sweating more and more throughout this. So then we finally got that looking okay. I got a K wire in it and held it. Then we started to work a little bit through the you know through the AIP portion of the approach. Uh, you know, so this is an ilioinguinal, but I, I extended to the medial window. I usually do not use the medial window in ilioinguinal, but here we went that way, and it's basically the same as an EIP. Uh, and then we finally got some fixation into the back that was stabilizing the, the whole thing. And just like Hassan said, you know, little plate here, little plate there. Let's push on this. Let's push on that. And, you know, this is this is about nine years ago now. Um, and this is what we ended up with sort of on the on the front view. <clears throat> Here's our post stop. Uh, I'm not sure is that enough hardware. It's not probably good enough. Enough pieces. That's everywhere. why I tell my trainees that before the case. Yeah, <laughs> so absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but you know, given this, I think I think the roof is maybe a little bit high at its most medial aspect. But that that really just could not hold it down anymore. I got a good lag screw into it. We lagged the back. I wasn't worried about that. I've not seen those posterior walls in the back shift if you get a lag screw into them when they're associated with a both column. Um, so these were my views. You can see there's that little bit of step in the front. So there's a mild incongruity that I just, I couldn't make any better. Maybe you guys could have, I, I could not, I was, I was actually thrilled that I thought maybe she had a chance at having a hip <clears throat> and here's her inlet, uh, and her outlet views. You can see we did fix across the SI joint, which was also unstable, but overall I was not unhappy with it. This was her at two years. Um, and she, you know, she really didn't degenerate much by the two year mark. And I always tell them if they get two years and their joint is normal looking, it's going to get probably 10 because that's the ladder and L data is two equals 10. Um, so that, that was ended up, uh, what we did. I actually talked to her during COVID in 2019. So she's a, is eight years out then, and she was still doing well, didn't need a total hip. When she came back for this two year follow-up that I got, I got a CAT scan because she was bothered a little bit. Uh, towards the back of her joint. I couldn't quite understand what was happening, but this is sort of what the CAT scan cuts look like. You can see some of that devastation in the front. I tried to get the cut through the roof there on that third image. It's probably right where that little bit of incongruity is, but it, you know, overall for what she had, I was, I was pretty happy uh, with this. I don't know, any, any comments or criticisms or thoughts? <coughs> Yeah, that's that's a, a really good outcome yeah. for not going to the back and doing it all from the front and sparing her a total hip. <coughs> so far, <laughs> so far, so far. So far, so good. But then it's so much um, pleasant for us to go in there in case uh, she needs a replacement because I think it's so much, uh, you know, the restoration of the <coughs> and I, the full stock. I, you know, it's yeah. a piece of cake. Thank you very much. I think um, we still have no <coughs> questions. So uh, I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, maybe people are um, absolutely clear about everything which we are talking about. So we go on to the next session. And uh, the next session, I would like to invite uh, somebody who has been uh, keeping quiet and has been behind the scenes is uh, my friend, Dr. Vikas Agashe. And he is going to talk about the tips for uh, intracranial fractures. <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Vikas. <coughs> we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I would be talking about intertrochantric fractures, some tips and tricks. 
essentially of course i'll focus on unstable intertrochanteric and we keep on talking a lot about uh, hardware and the common saying is unstable intertrochanteric should be nailed and in spite of a proximal femoral nail occasionally one would have uh, a significant failure on the other hand sometimes with dhs also uh, people will throw a fit if uh, they say this a lateral wall is actually osteotomized and then dhs done but with fantastic results so what is the key what is the key or what are the tips and tricks to achieve success and i'll focus more on software rather than hardware i'll be talking more about the tricks so the first thing is revisit anatomy think beyond trabecular pattern so in addition to the classic trabecular pattern that is described intertrochanteric region has cortical supports and the thickness of medial and anterior cortex is much bigger than the posterior and lateral cortex that's uh, uh, an important thing and then second is understand the pathophysiology of intertrochanteric fractures and here i come to the uh, a classic paper by james carr published in 2007 and he says that most intertrochanteric fractures are external rotation injuries so with external rotation the anterior cortex breaks in tension and it produces a clean fracture line if the external rotation continues and when you get a complete intertrochanteric fracture the posterior cortex breaks in compression as you see here and it produces a comminuted fracture now this theory is borne out by a study published in 2016 101 ct scans of pertrochanteric fractures of the 61 comminution or cases where who had comminution all 61 had posterior comminution and only 3 had anterior as well as posterior comminution so essentially the comminution is posterior coming back to karsh paper so what he suggests is we often try to achieve stability posterior which is not possible and if you fix uh, the fracture like this the post, the proximal fragment will displace in spite of a good implant because there would be an uncontrolled collapse there would be no bony stability achieved and the post proximal fragment will continue to collapse and will lead to failure on the other hand we try to achieve stability anterior medially whether there is a clean fracture line there will be excellent bone to bone contact as you can see here of a good cortical bone and the implant would give additional stability because you have already converted an unstable fracture into a sort of stable fracture and the implant gives additional stability and you will have a very happy situation so question is how do you convert these unstable fractures into stable fractures several methods are described and we have many many simple but useful tools and tricks as uh, this the spikes the hooks the the uh, hooks which are into various has various angles the shan screws or standman pins or even a hemostat so the these crooked hooks can be put in percutaneously if there is an excessive valgus then they can be put in on the uh, uh, medial and inferior side if there is a significant varus they can be put superiorly and laterally if there is an anterior displacement they can be put anteriorly and if there is a posterior displacement as you can see here there is a posterior displacement and one does an intrafocal reduction so i put a spike inside the fracture site and levered it out levered the posterior fragment out and then 
uh, uh, held it with the KY. Uh, hemostatic method was described way back in 2010, mainly for a little lower fractures. But here I have uh, shown it on a bone model. You can see the tense, uh, tight fascia lata. And then against that fascia lata, taking a little posterior incision, one could put a hemostat and reduce the, the proximal fragment. Shan screws or Steinman pins can be introduced here, essentially anteriorly. But it is best to hold the reduction with these anterior wires. Otherwise, they are very, very likely to slip. A 2020 paper also describes putting it into acetabulum. As you can see, the anterior K wire is put into the acetabulum, especially in a grossly unstable fracture like this. You can put it into the acetabulum, and this is after uh, putting a, a proximal femoral nail. But if the reduction is not held with key wires, I made this mistake. You can see a markedly comminuted fracture. And after I put in a nail, I realized that the anterior, the proximal fragment has gone way anterior. But it's not all that difficult. You put a spike and hold it and get a good anterior bone-to-bone -bone contact. Proceed with the fixation. And this is post-op. Uh, as, as a routine, we start weight bearing immediately. It is very, very difficult for elderly people to do non-weight bearing. This is her at four years. Unfortunately, had developed uh, intertrochantric on the other side. Sometimes there is global combination. As you saw, the three cases had a global combination. So here, if there is a global combination, uh, if there is an anterior combination as well as posterior combination, medial combination, then what do you do? then the best is to disregard the combination and get the anterior and medial stability, whatever it is. So avoid virus, avoid medialization of the shaft like this, have maintained valgus and just disregard this entire combination, get into, concentrate on intact cortices, whatever you have. So here I concentrated on the intact cortices disregarded the combination, and this is at healing. Sometimes you notice all this, uh, that you have produced a big medial defect, and of course you are worried that there would be an uncontrolled collapse and a failure. For example, here you can see she has a global combination, 84-year-old female. Uh, here you can see there is a significant comminuted intertrochantral fracture. And then uh, I put in a name, huge defect anteriorly as well as medially. I agree that my entry was a little uh, lateral. I should have gone a little more medially. But now what do I do? Do I revise the entire fixation? Whether I'll be able to get an entire fixation, uh, a good stable fixation. So. Just an out-of-box thinking. Can I improve the anterior medial stability? Can I graft this defect? And then I suddenly realized that the graft is just there with me. And I mobilized the lesser trochanter, just cut a few fibers of uh, ileosoas tendon, mobilized the lesser trochanter and punched in anteriorly and medially. Here you can see we have just punched in, disregarded the lateral cortex. And you can see that's the lateral view punched in the lesser trochanter to get a good anterior medial stability. Unfortunately, she had early post-op infection. So on 10th day, I explored, they debrided the muscle, the lateral wall. Also, there was some infection underneath the lateral wall. So I excised the lateral wall. What saved me and saved the patient was the anterior medial stability, which was afforded by the mobilized lesser trochanter. Here you can see at eight weeks, walking very comfortably. Uh, we had to start her on teriparatide because her uh, dexa was very poor. And this is at nine months. You can see she has consolidated very well, walking as per the pre-injury status for us, almost four months. She has an excellent 
range of movement and this is you can see the lateral wall formed by itself you really don't need to do anything for this lateral wall provided you have a good anterior medial stability and this is a two years you can see very well consolidated fracture so it was the anterior medial stability that is very important that is what saved us so that's the reason why even in good old days if you could achieve an anterior medial stability as you can see here today with people will as i said throw a fit if this is done uh, and again even i would not do this i would do a nailing in this case with a good anterior medial stability but this was done almost 18 years ago and as you can see here fracture has started consolidating and this is at one year absolutely consolidated fracture coming to some variants remember there are some irreducible variants of intertrochanteric fracture this was a paper published uh, almost 15 years ago uh, the authors described this as a irreducible variant of intertrochanteric fracture the lesser trochanter goes with the distal fragment and a spike of proximal fragment gets caught between the iliopsoas and the major fragment the lesser trochanteric fragment and different methods are described how to reduce it very often one has to do a less, uh, the soas tenotomy to get reduction done otherwise one would get a uh, uh, unacceptable reduction like this i would urge you to reduce uh, read this 2019 paper on predictors and reduction techniques of irreducible reverse intertrochanteric fractures and they have described various patterns of these irreducible less uh, intertrochanteric fractures last but not the least read the brochures carefully because every implant there are so many implants in 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 the world today that unless you know your implant very well you are going to have problems and today there are very often you use loaner sets and unless you check the instrumentation and implants previous night you could run in trouble in this in during the surgery so friends to summarize revisit the anatomy of proximal femur be desperate to achieve anterior medial stability because it converts an unstable fracture into stable fracture simple tricks and instruments are available to convert this remember there are irreducible variants of intertrochanteric very rare but they are there lastly as i said check the implants and instrumentation before at least a day prior to your surgery thank you very much friends thanks a lot uh, dr vikas if you will just unshare your screen yeah sure um so i am going to talk about the uh, the fixation strategies for uh, for the uh, fracture neck of femur uh, and uh, the learning objectives are how to fix intracapsular fracture neck of femur the choice of implant con configuration and does the type of fracture influence the implant choice and the special situations we know the choice of surgery depends on the fracture pattern the local factors like bone quality and the systemic factors fixation is preferred in physiologically young patients presenting early without arthritis with good bone, good bone quality and undisplaced fractures whereas older people with uh, arthritis low demand neglected cases and unsatisfactory reduction need arthroplasty so options for fixations are primary the multiple cancellous screws the hip screw system the proximal femoral plates cephalomedullary nails so uh, and the most common being the multiple uh, cancellous screws and hip screw systems so indications for internal fixation are all displaced fracture neck of femur and undisplaced fractures uh, uh, which are often recommended for internal fixation now if you thought that the undisplaced femoral fractures have no morbidity think again uh, they have long term daily comfort in 25% and clinical failure in 11% and uh, it was believed that the cancellous screws can be done easily with low complication and revision rates till that time um, this uh, paper came out 
which said that the revision surgery was more frequent and uh, it depended on poor bone quality, patient age, and some technical factors. Another paper which showed that the failure rates with cannulated, cannulated screws uh, was not low in elderly patients. So almost uh, advising against these in patients over 70 years old. And then if you have a valgus impacted neck fracture, it, it leads to uh, unsatisfactory post-operative locomotive function due to muscle shorting and decrease in the, uh, in the moment arm. So remember that. And of course, um, this paper said that there's no difference between the non-operative treatment, uh, which had uh, comparable results with the, uh, with the uh, screw fixation. So uh, this is a recent paper. And uh, this paper said that if you have an elderly person and you have unsplayed fracture, you are better off doing uh, latest generation hemiarthroplasty than screw fixation. So you see how the paradigm has been shifted. And this is actually the paper which said that if you have a posterior tilt angle of more than nine degrees or retroversion angle of more than 13 degrees on axial CT images, then you should do a primary hip arthroplasty in these patients. What about the timing of surgery? This uh, hip attack trial, which uh, my hospital was one of the participating sites, showed that accelerated surgery in less than six hours did not lower the risk of mortality or the risk of major complications. And most of, most people agree that if you have uh, um, a orthogeriatric co-management, uh, then surgery between 24 to 48 hours is actually quite safe. Reduction is the key and quality of reduction predicts the risk of AVN. So acceptable reduction this next shaft angle of 130 to 150 degrees or 0 to 15 degrees of antiversion. You should have low threshold for open reduction. You have a whole lot of reduction tools. You can use the joysticks, the Weber clamp, the reduction clamp, the femoral distractor or the Youngblood uh, clamp. Uh, and we are aware of the garden alignment index of 160 degree on AP and 180 degree in lateral. The Lovell's alignment theory looking for the uh, S or reversed S on all radiographic views and where a C curve shows a, a non-reduced fracture. Now, the young uh, adults are uh, often fixed with cancellous cannulated screws three or four dynamic or the sliding hip screw or angle blade plate, proximal femoral nail or the femoral neck system. So this is the plethora of devices which can be used to fix these fractures. Uh, there's no consensus for displaced fractures with an equal divide between the multiple screws and the sliding hip screw system. Um, the, what's the rationale for uh, cancellous cannulated screws? They are most commonly used, um, uh, easy to insert percutaneously, low blood loss, um, maintains the bone stock, improves the rotational strength and maintains the head vascularity. You can use three or four, seven or 7.3 millimeter cancellous screws. Uh, we recommend uh, that they should be parallel, though there's uh, evidence to the contrary. The screw head should be solely within the head. The inferior screw should be on the calcar and the washer should be used particularly in osteoporotic bone and you can put them subcutaneously. The inferior screw resists the inferior displacement while the posterior one resists the posterior displacement. The starting point for the inferior screw should not be below the lesser trochanter because that will cause a stress riser and cause a fracture. Um, the parallel inverted triangle, and I'm going to talk more about it, is, is the mechanical stability. Uh, and um, so what is the optimum configuration for uh, cannulated cancellous screws? This finite anal element analysis showed that an inverted triangle configuration has the uh, least advantage, least likelihood of cutting out and has the maximum uh, mechanical advantage. Uh, in elderly patients, the four quadrant peripheral screw uh, placement has been uh, described as called FQPP, four quadrant parallel peripheral screw fixation, uh, which uh, gives good results in patients more than 50 year old. Whereas if you have a young patient, you can use four uh, screws in a in a diamond configuration and, uh, uh, and that's... Um, the uh, choice. Now, whether you really need them to be parallel, this paper said no, because it said three screws which diverge and lie in different coronal planes, uh, and you can even put them freehand, it gives the enhanced fixation. Now, what about the risk of bony violation? This study was uh, published from uh, my hospital, and uh, it showed that, you know, in females especially, if you use the standard 6.5 millimeter screws, there's higher likelihood of uh, cutout. So, if you use one of the two superior screws 
uh, with a diameter of 4.5 millimeter, that risk can be considerably reduced. This is uh, an example of the close reduction uh, and um, a, a, the assessment and the fixation. Um, the posterior combination must be addressed. So if you have a posterior combination, you must put a fully threaded positioning screw uh, posteriorly to uh, support posterior combination. This is an example where the posterior combination was addressed with uh, two posterior uh, screws, uh, seven millimeter fully threaded. And uh, this is um, gone on to union with one year follow up. Uh, there is an F configuration de uh, described, which is the biplane double supported. The What worries me here is what I just told you. Such a, a distal starting point is really a risk of uh, 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 a stress riser and a fracture. Now, what is the role of a medial plate for powers type 3? Now, we are talking about the... Uh, the special situations, the, the uh, very oblique fractures. And this study showed that if you use a medial buttress plate, you have a mechanically superior construct for power type 3 fractures, which have been fixed with multiple cannulated screws. Um, there's a concept of a power screw, which is a trochanteric leg screw. And essentially, uh, it is a screw which is passed uh, um, uh, in this direction to improve the mechanical performance rather than a traditional inverted construct. And there's enough literature uh, recommending this because uh, it gives added mechanical stability. So you could pass a, a power screw. And uh, this is uh, one of our own cases. You can see. Uh, the reduction, the intraoperative wick the uh, and the power screw here, adding to the mechanical stability and went on to union. Um, it has been uh, recommended that if you are using an off-axis screw, the power screw, it, the purchase should preferably be bicortical. But remember, all these are for highly oblique vertical kind of orientation. What about the fixed angle? Devices, they maintain a fixed neck shaft angle. There are different various um, implants in, within the group. So uh, it's sliding hip screw, proximal femoral locking plates, and dynamic, dynamic condylar screw, cephalomedullary nail. Um, and um, they have the advantages of greater strength. So they have been recommended for power type 3 and the basilar neck fractures. They have a greater ability to resist virus angulation and inferior displacement of the head fragment. And they have the superior mechanics. Disadvantages are they are technically challenging, have a greater blood loss and uh, uh, may need a separate incision. Now, uh, a lot of systemic reviews have been done. And this one said that there is uh, actually a lesser complication with sliding hip screw and faster union time Whereas the other uh, um, um, uh, other uh, systemic review and meta-analysis said there was no difference except that there was a lower blood intraoperative blood loss with the cancellous screws. Um, in this particular paper, the FAITH trial, uh, they recommended that patients with displaced fractures, smokers, and the patients with base of neck fractures do better with a sliding hip screw. All other groups, they are comparable. Uh, this is an example of a fracture necrofema treated with the sliding hip screw, which of course always has to be done uh, with the uh, with the uh, derotation screw. A word here: a lot of surgeons are wary of using this combination for undisplaced fracture for the fear of displacing the undisplaced fracture because the talk, in spite of fixing it, maybe even through the to the acetabulum, like uh, Dr. Vikas Agashish showed, uh, still it is doesn't provide enough stability. So this is the one year follow up of the same patient. The cephalomedullary nails uh, have been tried with for basic cervical and uh, Powell's type three, and this is our faculty today. He has shown that if you use them over in you know, patients over 60 years of age, there's a 100% failure rate. So whether we may not know who are the good patients for using it, we know the patient in whom we should not use it. This is an example of uh, one of our own patients treated with uh, the cephalomedullary nail for a fracture neck of femur. Now, the latest kid on the block is the femoral neck system, and that is actually... Um, uh, 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 a new system, uh, the biomechanical evaluation has been done and published and it shows that, uh, you know, whether you are using a sliding uh, hip screw with a blade or with the screw or you are using the, um, the, um, uh, the cancel uh, cannulated screws, this provides a valid alternative and it has got advantages of being minimally invasive and gives good stability. So this is uh, uh, one of our own patients who... Uh, you can see the intraoperative pictures. You can see the 
the um, <clears throat> the gap at the fracture site and the best thing about this system is when you start compressing you can actually see the fracture go gap closing and it gives you 20 mm of control collapse uh, with a derotation screw here uh, and um, and a device uh, which allows a uh, control collapse here and a single screw here we have the only one available with a single screw in india though i suppose there are ones with double screws also and this is the post operative film uh, there is uh, the disadvantages there is very limited literature available for this this particular uh, registry uh, was supposed to have been completed by july i'm sure because of the pandemic uh, this 12 month period of recruiting 125 participants i doubt whether it has been done and this has been compiled uh, by one of my colleagues here uh, who has actually summarized the advantages and disadvantages of all the cannulated um, screws have higher failure rate and they do not have a control collapse and they are biomechanically inferior though they have the advantage of being minimally invasive easy to use and economical the dhs with anti rotation screw is stable preferred in powell three less failures but then has in this operative time and the blood loss and then there's a risk of femoral head rotation when inserting the uh, leg screw and there's a certain risk of avascular necrosis the femoral neck system has got the disadvantage of cost availability and not much literature being available however it does have advantages of small incision surgery less blood loss less operative time it's mechanically comparable to dhs and then it does not displace the undisplaced fracture to summarize the young patient with undisplaced fractures we prefer the fixation the ccs and dhs are the most common methods of fixation dhs is biomechanically uh, superior clinically they have similar outcomes but have higher uh, increased blood loss and higher avn with dhs smokers basic cervical and displaced dhs might be better uh, option uh, and then of course uh, or you should operate within 48 hours inverted triangle configuration is the best in smaller or uh, patients or females you can use one of the top screws as 4.5 the diamond quadrangular powell screw and posteriorly fully threaded screws have their advantages in particular situation and powell type 3 needs special consideration i thank you very much for your attention so now we are on to the case presentation and um, um uh, would i uh, i would like to request dr vikas agash to present his case in the interest of time i would request the participants to be quick um dr vikas yeah sure the stage is yours thank you thank you a relatively simple case as compared to the real complex cases that were discussed so uh, this is a uh, British man presented with non-union of intertrochanteric. You can see the greater trochanter here. There is a big gap and non-union of the shaft. You can see there is a significant varus and anterior defect at the non-union. No comorbidities. A bit obese person. No evidence of infection, and he has been walking non-weight bearing. so here we have we have a non union of intertrochanteric following an implant with a varus and an anterior gap so may i invite suggestions may i invite suggestions dr vivek uh, mm -hmm. dr. paul and uh, dr mir and dr malhotra any suggestions yeah so i would uh, revise this with uh uh i would re-nail it but i would do an open nailing i would do a cephalomedullary nail and i would harvest bone graft at the same time and and uh utilize bone graft and okay. at uh certainly at the shaft fracture uh you know the consideration could be to revise to uh, also with a retrograde nail and then a dynamic hip screw and anti rotation screw and treat them as two separate injuries which possibly could have been done on the index procedure right. um but i think one of those two constructs would be my choice so how, how far out is this now it's about 8 eight months after injury out 8 months yeah so so the the problem here is that there was nailed in varus right so i think i think you've got to not just look at the femoral shaft here because the femoral shaft is easy right you know you work it up for infection 
maybe you'd aspirate if you have concerns. I would definitely do a metabolic workup because femoral shafts generally do heal unless their vitamin D is very low. So I typically replace their vitamin D as well. Um, although there's, you know, the jury is out on whether that matters, but I don't think it can possibly hurt. But I think the real question here is, do you want to solve the femoral shaft injury in isolation, or do you want to combine that with a, a VIT and realign the proximal segment? Because this, this is not going to be a good hip over time uh, with that much varus displacement. Um, so I would actually talk to the patient about it. I think the patients have a lot to say about their own care. Um, I would explain that I think we need to correct that varus displacement at the femoral neck. We could either get the shaft solved and come back and do that, or theoretically, you could do a, a VIT uh, with a proximal lock plate uh, and extend that plate down with a graft over the net, over the shaft and do it all with one procedure. But I think you've got you've to deal with both problems. And I would definitely work up infection. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Vivek? Yeah, the same thing. The only thing is, at this time, I might not go in for a DNA. What I'm worried about is that short segment in the proximal fragment, which is which may not give me the best fixation for a DFN if we am going to use any of my angle blade plate or a proximal locking plate for my reduction and correction with VIT of the proximal neck fracture. So the plate and the screw, I might go in with a VIT and going with a longer plate for that. And that okay. is going in the same sitting. That's my... Yeah, okay. Right, right, right. Dr. Malhotra? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm uh, missing part of the discussion. There are some urgent messages from that okay. uh, from okay. the uh, uh, no, COVID ICU. Um, right. uh, please carry on. Okay, 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 sure. So, of course, uh, the challenges were virus, bone loss. Obviously, there's bound to be fibrous tissue at the non-union site and a vascular bone. And, of course, we have an ipsilateral femur. So... Obviously, one needs to remove the implant, excise the sclerotic bone and fibrous tissue, and we need to realign, fix, and a graft. The question was, do we do an angulation correction osteotomy, and whether we use a single implant or a double implant or replace? So whether we do uh, uh, use a DHS with a bone graft or whether we put a uh, 95 degree and correct it, and... Whether if we use two different implants, then as discussed, whether we do a distal femoral nail and a plate. So we basically decided to use a single implant, uh, a Cyrus nail with uh, three screws proximally with one miss a nail technique, one screw at the subtrochantric level and three distal screws. But something which was very, very important, and this was a 2010 paper in ISAO about primary non-union of intertrochantric fracture and valgazization and tips about excision of fibrous tissue and realignment. We were always thinking how to realign this proximal fragment. So the paper mentions that the clearance is generally done superiorly, anteriorly and inferiorly. Obviously, you can't go posteriorly and the common pitfall follows. The defect is often closed by internal rotation to get a good bone-to-bone -bone contact. Obviously, one needs to have a good bone-to-bone -bone contact. And then there is an excessive antiversion. And then the guide wire would be unacceptable in a lateral view. So I've just uh, shown this on a, this picture. The, if there is a defect, very often the defect is closed by internal rotation. But what they and which would lead to excessive antiversion. So instead, graft should be put in this space and then one can fix. So, uh, uh, the, uh, what we proceeded with that, you can see we did a lateral exposure on fracture table. We explored the, the fracture site or non union site, removed the implants, and then used two thin osteotomes to excise. Rather than going at the fracture site, we were used to thin osteotomes and just excise the sclerotic bone with the fibrous tissue in toto. Then put two K wires here to keep to derotate the head and keep it in appropriate position of valgus and an appropriate antiversion. Then 
put graphs here and put a 12 millimeter cyrus nail with a pisa nail proximally and of course rim the distal part and uh, put a graph there this is post op x ray this is with correct antiversion at 4 months we thought that the femur was going into delayed union so we took out the subtrochanteric screw this is at 6 months healed quite well this is at 10 months and this is at 4 years absolute excellent function so to recapitulate uh, closing the gap is to be avoided avoid antiversion so most important is angulation correction is very very important it is a challenging situation in young patients, of course, we need to preserve the head. And uh, as I said, angulation correction is uh, the vital thing as far as non-union of proximal femur is concerned. A very nice algorithm is described in this article about failed intertrochanteric fractures. What factors determine the failure? This is 2020 recent uh, uh, paper where they consider whether the what is the hair, the uh, condition of the femoral head? If it is destroyed, obviously, we need to do arthroplasty. If the physiological activity is good, then, of course, we need to do a total hip, low demand, hemiarthroplasty. If the head is saved, if there is a deformity, one needs to do an osteotomy. If the deformity can be corrected or there is no deformity, if the inferior portion of the head is intact, then one does a 95 degrees DHS uh, uh, angle blade plate to derotate, or if it is superior, then a 95 degrees angle blade plate. So this is a very nice algorithm for non-union intertrochanteric fractures uh, or a failed intertrochanteric fractures uh, described in 2020. A very nice article. Please read this article. Thank you, friends. Thank you, Dr. Vikas. Uh, we have a large series of uh, managing the failed uh, intertrochanteric fracture fixation with dynamic hip screw. And, uh, you know, while we create a valgus, uh, we have been putting the fibula in the track uh, right. of the uh, lag screw and then using uh, a condylar blade plate, 95 degree condylar blade plate, still very right. fond of it. Actually, uh, we don't need... Uh, the compression you need um, uh, and uh, it actually compromises very little bone and uh, that uh, I have found to be very, very useful. Uh, right. um, uh, anybody uh, would make any other comments related to Dr. Vikas's uh, presentation? Asim? No, so, I, uh, yeah. I, I, like to, I like to treat all of my uh, proximal femur non-unions with revision nailing. Uh, it's just... I like to allow immediate weight bearing and, and I don't always feel confident with that with the blade. Also, I'm from the generation that doesn't do many blades. <laughs> and so uh, right. nailing is much more familiar to me. It's easy. It's not as technically challenging and it allows immediate weight bearing and have pretty good success with the union. I'm from that older generation. My boss used to do a lot of, in fact, I love this implant. Uh, no, it's, it's a great implant. It really doesn't compromise anyone. Thank you very much. We come to the last presentation of this track. And I would request uh, uh, Dr. Hassan Mee to present case on proximal femoral fracture. <coughs> Dr. Hassan, please. Okay. So um, this is a 71-year-old uh, woman who's actually an Indian lady who lives here in Tampa, but was vacationing in Morocco with her husband and was on in one of the little markets and fell and broke her hip. And then she tells the story of how she was put in a cart pulled by a donkey and taken to the local hospital there and uh, had this fixation done in Morocco. And this was eight months before I met her. Then she came back to Florida and uh, wasn't doing so well and uh, found somebody at another hospital who decided, well, you know, your problem is that you need stem cells. So took her to the operating room and made her pay several thousand dollars in cash and injected stem cells, but somehow they didn't work. And so now she presents to our clinic and is having significant pain with ambulation. She's using a walker before this very healthy fit lady. They're recently retired. They're traveling the world, but now is, you know, in significant pain. Uh, really minimal past medical history. She did have uh, uh, osteoporosis in the past and had been on long-term uh, bisphosphonates. 
uh, but in the few months before I met her, had gone to an endocrinologist and had uh, switched to uh, denosumab, which is, you know, not a bisphosphonate, but is an anti-resorptive drug for, uh, for osteoporosis as well. So on examined clinic, she's got a one uh, millimeter, excuse me, one centimeter limb length discrepancy and about a 25 degree rotational deformity. And you can see that, you know, uh, she's uh, in Barris there. So she has the clip, uh, typical deformities you would expect with a subtrochanteric fracture with the proximal segment uh, flexed in varus and malrotated, and it was just kind of nailed in in situ there. So, you know, I'd like to hear from uh, from the group what uh, what they would do with this patient now. From, from yeah, can I? Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, so. Uh, a, the virus needs to be corrected. Rotation needs to be corrected. There's bound to be a sclerotic bone there which needs to come out, which would obviously lead to defect. I would personally use a combination of uh, a nail as well as plate. I'll put a nail. Uh, it is quite likely that my nail will keep straying on the tract of the previous nail. And therefore, I like to use allografts or some grafts to block that hole and take a little medial entry. So I have a, a valgus there. I'll possibly use a cyrus nail so that I can have three screws. And then I'll, in addition to grafts, I will put a, a plate. Uh, if I'll, I'll go with a classical, I'm an old fashioned surgeon. For me, this is an ideal case for doing an angle blade plate. You have varus, you have already the osteotomy, which has been done for you. If required, it's a recalcitrant non-union because it's a atypical sort of a fracture. If it is, I might go in, I use a tensioning device in the lower part to give me that tensioning and the compression, which I want. The rotational element, I can easily correct when I have opened up that fracture site. And if required, there are papers which suggest that I can use a small plate on the interior side if I require to get an addition, additional fixation, which may not be there in a 71-year-old lady with an angle blade plate, I might add a small plate on the interior femur with a bone graft while doing an osteotomy. That's interesting. It's close to what I would do. So, so it's it's an atypical femur fracture that you can see that beaking. And, you know, I'm assuming that, you know, when you do full-length films that correcting the, the varus into valgus will get your length back. And, you know, Hassan will tell us if that's, if that's incorrect, because you do that assessment, of course. Um, but, you know, these are ones that are, <clears throat> that are almost non-unions when they start, right? Because they have such poor osteoclastic function. So I would take this all down. I would actually burr the ends off and potentially even do flat osteotomy at the edge. And then I would, I would crank it down with two screws on the lateral side to really correct the valgus. I usually put a small like three, five anterior plate on to hold it in place because I find that it's very hard. There's so many dimensions of freedom. I find it difficult to, to control everything with just clamp. So you compress it laterally, put an anterior plate on to hold it. Then I would use a, I would use a, one of the newer locked plates rather than a blade, I think for this. Um, but one of those two options and then really compress it on the lateral side, like just, just compress it until that screw is about to fall out. And before you do that, you just got to loosen up the screws on one side of the plate. Um, and then I may, I may replace those anterior plate screws at an angle uh, or just take them off depending on the fixation. I would probably add some sort of, you know, RHBMP2 or something with graft to the, what will be an anterior defect after you burr it out. But I think you want maximal compression uh, for, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an atrophic non-union with poor response. So I, I, I don't love nailing these. I think it's perfectly reasonable to do it, but I've, I've just had really such good success with maximal compression in these that I, I, would, I wouldn't change unless someone showed me somehow that was clear evidence to the contrary. So uh, let me give you another uh, different uh, way. I mean, I'm also old fashioned, only slight, uh, a few years senior to uh, Vivek. But I think in all such cases where there's an issue about uh, healing potential of the bone, um, uh, we have actually published it in Humerus, but I would always like to take out the nail and push a fibula down the, uh, the, the same track. 
so i have the biological material traversing but before that of course i will freshen the bone ends correct the varus push a fibula down have it uh, traversing the fracture site and put a condylar blade plate and put a old fashioned muller compression device to get as much compression as i can and then put bone grafts around it and then fix it um again i heard paul say that he would use a, a locking plate uh, that's fine i mean if i could get a, a, a condylar blade plate with locking screws even better but then uh, this is how i'll proceed which i suppose is another way of doing the thing but i am always more comfortable if i have bone in both the fragments and that's where our experience of using fibula intermedullary works very well which would to me which would push me to use only an extramedullary implant and not an intermedullary because i want a fibula in there uh, securing the fracture going across the fracture site and putting the grafts from outside so you're you're doing a nail plate combo but with a fibular allograft strut as Absolutely. your nail not allograft actually autograft but then if it's easier to get a patient yeah. zone fibula than uh, <laughs> to get yeah. the allograft although i have a bank but then yeah got it okay so I'll show you what we did here. So I decided to uh, to re-nail it. Um, I like compression, but I don't think nailing and compression go against each other per se. So um, I always like to measure the contralateral limb. So that shows you her one centimeter discrepancy. She's 39 centimeters on the right, 38 on the left. Her rotation, which I don't think is as accurate as what I'll show next, which is uh, looking at femoral neck version on the lateral. And then obviously your varus valgus uh, neck shaft angle you can compare here. Uh, this is looking at the lateral. You can see that her uh, antiversion is off by at least uh, 25 degrees there. And so that's our, our uh, planning. Uh, and then here we uh, opened it, took down the non-union, um, and then uh, use a reamer irrigator aspirator to harvest uh, autograft from the ipsilateral uh, femur. Um, and got a decent amount of bone. I, anytime I use this though, I always mix it with cancellous chips just because in case, early cases when I used this and didn't have any chips, not for volume of graft, but just I found that it, it consolidates better when you mix it with some allograft chips as well. Um, next, this is me getting compression drill. Uh, I, I do agree completely with uh, taking down the atrophic area of bone and drilling it in multiple fragments. Uh, I used a blocking wire to help with uh, with alignment in addition to a lateral uh, clamp to help gain uh, compression at the fracture site. And then uh, this was our final uh, length, which we got uh, back within a few millimeters and our final rotation, which we got back uh, uh, within a few degrees. So that's uh, that's what we did. Uh, here she was at one year, uh, healed, walking uh, back to uh, uh, all activities. Um, you know, one thing I definitely agree with trying to uh, start with a more medial start point on the revision nailing uh, we did, but it was challenging to keep it there. So I also do nail plate combos, but in this case with just the blocking wire, we were able to get it realigned. So I didn't have to put a plate uh, anterior immediately. Uh, the other thing in these bisphosphonate fractures is, um, you know, uh, the contralateral limb. So during the course of her treatment, she did start to develop I think psychologically a little bit of thigh pain because I told her of the risk of the other side. So we got an MRI of the other side, didn't show any spots that were lighting up. And finally she calmed down and we ended up not prophylactically nailing the other side, but uh, certainly a discussion in these, with these patients is the, is the other limb. Hey son, I see you did a, you did a static lock distally. Why not a dynamic lock distally? So uh, that's a, a big thing that that uh, uh, that our chairman here, Dr. Sanders, harps on. So if I if I'm worried about not having the fracture clicked in and compressed, I would lock it dynamically. Uh, but on her, I, I I had it. I was staring at it. It's compressed, and I'm bone grafting it, so I, I locked it statically. And and you guys, do you, does anybody else use PTH for these? Yes, of course. I wanted to say that that would be an absolutely mandatory part of treatment because many times as orthopedic surgeons, we forget that in fact the case with Dr. Vikas showed had intertrochantric fracture and then had it on the other side. I was tempted to ask whether any treatment was given after the first intertrochantric or not. 
Yeah, because yeah. it is on us, you know, if she yeah. comes back with the opposite side fracture right. and she has not been treated on fracture. Uh, this And other thing uh, which we get sometimes, which I have observed is uh, uh, high diabetics who have very high HP1C and highly uncontrolled uh, diabetes. We have often found that their PTH levels are quite low, 10 or 12. And they often go into uh, non-union, much like, uh, you know, you hear the atypical fractures occurring in patients who have not had uh, bisphosphonates. And in those cases also, PTH really works. So in a case like this, I would have certainly done a PTH assessment to know that uh, it's not hypodynamic or adynamic bone, although classically seen in the renal transplant patients. But uh, uh, in all such cases, I do like to see the levels of PTH and then supplement PTH. Yeah, so I forgot to mention she was uh, switched to PTH uh, early course. on. And then uh, the other thing to mention th is that when I treat these acutely, um, for me, a lot of these are an open reduction. So I can drill the uh, the fracture site and treat it like a non-union case on the initial case. Great. So, so is uh, I'm not, are we over time? I had another case, but if not, I can stop. It's fine. I, I, I think we are okay with the case. Please go ahead. I'm, I'm sure the audience would love it. We can make it quick, but let's not miss out the, on that opportunity. Uh, so you want me to show it then? Please. Okay. All right. Are you seeing the screen again? Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So case two. So this is a, a lady. And, uh, you're in presentation mode though, so that we see like the next slide. Next slide, slide. Also. Hold on. Hold on. But a regular slideshow. Sorry. All right. Let me try it one more time. All right. Better? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. So this is a 72 year old patient who is vacationing in, in Mexico in Cancun and uh, for Christmas with her family and uh, fell and, and broke her hip and was taken to a local hospital there where she had uh, this fixation done and then came back to the to Tampa for uh, for follow up. So she's three weeks out. Uh, she has severe pain with ambulation uh, using a walker previously relatively healthy. She had a distant history of a uh, deep venous thrombosis and is on a direct oral anticoagulant uh, pill for that. She also had a previous history of long-term bisphosphonate use but that was stopped by her primary care physician years ago. And she presents with severe pain, a two centimeter leg length discrepancy and a 30 degree uh, rotational deformity. And uh, this is her imaging. So, uh, so comments is uh, this, she's only three weeks out from surgery and wounds look okay. No signs of infection, et cetera. So uh, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's 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 going to fail. Like, you know, I'm really conservative when people come in with stuff that doesn't look perfect. People get sent in all the time for this isn't healing on x-ray. And I tend to watch things for a long time. But th this is not <laughs> this is not that case. So, you know, this this is malaligned. It's embarrassed. It's often rotation and it's short. So this one, unfortunately, is one that's going to need an acute reconstruction. And I would, you know, I would, I would take it down at three weeks. You're going to be able to get an anatomic reduction probably just by doing it open. And I would get clamps on it and I would, I would nail it. I'm sure you're not going to put that long a plate. So uh, what about all these stress risers? You know, just leave them <laughs> free. Yeah, but I, I would just do a, I would do a long nail. So it just bypasses all of yeah, that. I exactly. think that's the absolute indication for nail. Yeah, same. Same. All right, good. We have consensus. First case of the day with consensus. <laughs> so that was my plan as well. Again, just similar to the last case, planning with uh, length alignment and rotation of the uninjured limb. And then uh, here this was after simply just taking off the prior implant and having her on a traction table now. It uh, aligned well. Uh, and then just proceeded with, uh, with, uh, nailing and, uh, you know, got her length alignment and rotation equal to the other side. And, uh, here she was at one year, uh, healed. So. That just means it was too simple a case. If you couldn't get us to disagree, you know, you gotta... <laughs> oh, that's why I showed it and I was going to, I was going to just stop, but it was the first case of the day with Universal international consensus. How there about you. that? <laughs> but Paul, I don't agree with you. 
that the uh, the uh, simple cases don't lead to dissent i mean i knowing orthopedic surgeons i don't believe that at all yeah, that's simple true. things don't deter them from arguing <laughs> that's a valid that's a valid point that's a valid point <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot gentlemen um, it has been a great track i'm i'm really appreciative of the effort you put in before we wind up there uh, we have to be fair to the people who have asked questions just quick questions paul there's a question for you uh, for your case would you have considered infix so your thoughts on infix yeah so i've i've used infix um i don't know maybe 12 15 times i have a couple of cases where i've used it in isolation <clears throat> um I'm not thrilled with it. You know, I really loved the idea of it when it came out to avoid the anterior frames and 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 keep out of people's way. Um, it is, you know, it is a little bit hard to place because you've got to bend the ends of the rods. It's such a high degree to avoid the femoral nerve. And there's been a publication looking at right. femoral nerve impingement. And I, and I haven't had that happen. Um, and, and I had, would say that patients tend to tolerate it uh, better than an X-fix. But 100% of those patients get HO when you around those implants deep. Um, I've only had one patient who's complained of it, but they all form it, and it's a, it's a little bit of a bigger deal to take it out. So I, I've actually switched back to just doing anterior frames, you know, in the handover position and leaving them on for six eight weeks, and then and then just taking them out in the OR. It seems it seems to be somewhat easier, <clears throat> and, I, and I and I didn't feel like the infix was was such a huge advantage to the patients in whom I used it. And and then the difficulty of removing, like you said, is a big. Uh, yeah, it's a little harder to get out. You've got to watch the nerve. You know, you've got to do a real approach. You've got to excise all that HO. Um, so I, I just, I'm just not sure it's worth the convenience for the eight weeks that it has to be there. Sure, Paul. There are a couple of quick questions for you. The first one is, how do you um, ensure a medial entry point in a very obese patient? And second, your experience of using cement augmentation, and I presume it's PMMA augmentation of the uh, screw uh, for a proximal femoral fracture. Well, so in, in really obese patients, you can do them lateral. Um, I, I don't do a lot of that. I still mostly do them supine. But if you put the patient in a real C position, you can usually get that medial start point. Um, if they're very, very heavy, doing them lateral is going to make it a lot easier because as soon as you flex the hip, you can you can easily access. I mean, we used to do a ton of piriformis nails in that position, and it's not hard. So I think the, the more obese, the more you might want to go lateral. Um, I have no experience with PMMA in the femoral head. I've never done that operation. Uh, I use the same implant that you saw Hassan use, uh, which is a, it's sort of a double screw device. And I don't know that it matters what one you use, but, but having more than one fixation point in the head gives you that stronger rotational control, which is what I think you get out of the PMMA. And I, I haven't had that cut out uh, as long as you put it in a, in a good spot. I don't know if other people on the panel have experience with PMMA. I just haven't done that. Dr. Hassan, would you like to supply, uh, uh, supplement that answer? Right. So I think that um, I think that augmentation is an interesting concept, but to me, I don't know that PMMA is the right way to go. I think there are other uh, substances coming out that that may be better and and that'll work with implants uh, that might be more advantageous. Because from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, the PMMA that you're using is also exothermic, and so you're frying the inside of the head that you're trying to salvage and save. So that doesn't make sense to me. So if you can use something that's that's not exothermic and that also is more biologic and will remodel, uh, then that makes a lot more sense if you're going to do augmentation with another material. The other, the other interesting thing is, you know, using using the calcium phosphate concept, yeah. right, as Hassan was alluding to, but there is an international study. I don't know if any of you are involved, but it's called the Restore Study that myself and, and a, a colleague from Italy are the co-PIs for this international trial, which I think is very interesting. I got involved. Um, I'm not with the company or anything, but I got involved because I saw the early data on this, and it was it was pretty uh, it was it was pretty convincing for something that I wouldn't have thought was a great idea. Which is uh, this is for the contralateral hip in patients who have femoral neck or intertro fractures of of burring out the inside and inserting a phosphate to have it then heal. And, and I, I, you know, 
this has been talked about for 25 years. Like this is the first time we had sulfates and phosphates. We were talking about this and, you know, how do we deal with the other hip in these patients? And it, it was dramatic how much these things, the increase in bone quality that with the resorption that occurred, I was, I was actually very surprised enough so that I've now gotten involved with this study. So I think that there's going to be some stuff coming out around what you do for the other side of the hip. Um, can you prevent fracture and, and using that same concept, you know, now that that's been in my mind, pretty well shown, at least in a series of about 50 patients, uh, that same concept as, as, uh, as uh, Hassan was alluding to, of using the phosphates around some of our devices now that actually may create more bone rather than just taking something out and providing a, a temporary thing that gets crushed or resorbed. So that, that may be something to look into in the future. I wouldn't do it today, but, but I think it's something that may be coming down the pipe. And uh, Dr. Hassan, what about uh, BMP? Uh, uh, Paul mentioned in the discussion. Uh, do you use it very often? Because, you know, we have very limited uh, exposure to that. One, it is prohibitively expensive. And we have had a couple of patients throw up a very vicious allergic reaction, almost uh, needing uh, transfer to ICU following the uh, BMP. So what's your uh, experience with the BMP? Yeah, so um, 10 or 12 years ago, I used it more often. The last five years, I can't remember the last, I haven't used it at all. So I, I, I use a lot of autograft. And then if I want to supplement it, I'll, I'll go more towards a cellular product or something, but I, I, I don't use uh, BMP anymore. I, I still use it on occasion. You know, when, when I use it is for like the last time I used it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a patient with a with a legitimate 3C injury who had a bypass from their popliteal to their perineal, to their posterior tibial perineal trunk and, and lost their entire anterolateral compartment. I honestly think it's going to end up with an amputation. And we did a, a fibulectomy uh, along that entire area to allow closure of sort of the posterior column to a medial gastroc flap around the front. So I'm not sure it's going to be salvageable. And there was a big defect that is going to be difficult to get back to. So situations like that where I don't want to use graft, I want to do something to maybe give ourselves one good shot. I think that's sort of the ideal circumstance for our HBMP2. So it's time when I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to sacrifice someone's own bone. Uh, and, uh, and I want to just give myself some help. Uh, so things like that, I think, are, are good indications because it does form bone. Um, Although it's it's it is expensive, so it's it's you know we use it once or twice a year probably. So this was in an acute fracture setting, right? Not a delayed union or non-union. Yeah, I generally I generally don't use it in uh, in delayed and non-union. I, I prefer autograft, and that's what I've I've used for my whole career. I, I'm not a big BMP user for for those. Great. Any other closing editorial comments remarks? Well, if not, I must thank you, gentlemen. We have actually uh, kept you engaged for half an hour extra, and that's the uh, testimony to the fact that uh, it has been very engaging uh, interaction. Uh, I have learned a lot, and I'm sure all of us uh, had this uh, great opportunity to interact with each other, and uh, we had some exciting uh, cases once again. I appreciate your participation, your time, and I want to thank Insignia for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, sort of uh, pilot this um, track. And once again, I think it's a great session because we have had great faculty. Thank you very much and have a great day for those in US and have a great evening in India. Bye-bye. Thanks so much thank for you. having me. Thank you. Listen, guys, be, be safe, okay? Thank you. Best wishes. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Bye.